Hello, a very good morning. It's seven o'clock. Coming up on today's show, Joe Biden declares democracy is under attack at home and abroad in his flagship speech as he confirms plans to deliver aid to Gaza via the sea. Plus, the ballooning black hole in funding for the UK's armed forces. We'll hear from the Treasury this morning about the MOD's £29 billion deficit. And in sports, India looks set to build a big first in his lead over England in the fifth test. It's Friday the 8th of March. President Biden says history is watching in his State of the Union address with attacks on Donald Trump, Vladimir Putin and a stark caution for Israel's leadership. Humanitarian assistance cannot be a secondary consideration or a bargaining chip. Protecting and saving innocent lives has to be a priority. It's a message that I think will be received with some concern here in Israel, where there is a dependence on the United States for Israel's own security. Sky News hears the anger of a family who paid thousands to people smugglers to reach Britain, only for their daughter to drown in the channel. She was seven years old. She'd seen nothing in this world. MPs warn that the UK has no plan to fund the armed forces as the MOD's budget deficit balloons to a potential £29 billion. After 27 years in Parliament and a challenging three in number 10, former Prime Minister Theresa May announces her intention to stand down. And Liverpool have one foot in the Europa League quarter-finals after thrashing Sparta Prague 5-1. Hello, a very good morning, and thanks so much for joining us here on Breakfast this morning. Our top story here today, in the year that we'll go, see him go head-to-head -head with Donald Trump once again, Joe Biden made his pitch to American voters overnight, declaring that freedom and democracy were under attack, both at home and abroad. His State of the Union address was a broadside of both his predecessor and President Putin. There was also a caution to the United States chief ally, Israel, over the worsening humanitarian crisis in Gaza, as he confirmed plans to deliver aid via the sea. Our US correspondent Mark Stone reports. President, how are you feeling, sir? Feeling good. It had been billed by his own side as a reset moment, a chance for the president to show a nation on prime time that the State of the Union is good under him. But even his journey there was to be complicated. Well, the president's due to drive down here, down Pennsylvania Avenue to Capitol Hill to make this all-important State of the Union address. It's been described as a make-or-break moment, and this is one of so many challenges that he faces. He avoided them, took another route to the hill, to the podium. No, it may not look like it, but I've been around a while. <laughs> When you get to be my age, certain things become clearer than ever. This is not traditionally the moment for partisan speeches, but he couldn't or wouldn't avoid it. Donald Trump on his mind, if not by name, throughout. Now my predecessor, my predecessor, my predecessor, my predecessor, my predecessor came to office determined to see Roe v. Wade overturn. Abortion was a key issue. Many of you in this chamber and my predecessor are promising to pass a national ban on reproductive freedom. My God, what freedom else would you take away? <laughs> and then an eyeballing for the justices who had restricted national abortion rights two years ago. With all due respect, justices, women are not without electoral or political power. You're about to realize just how much you were right about that. It was heckling from the right. I as he chastised them for blocking his immigration legislation, even though it was legislation they had wanted. On the economy, he tried to persuade the American people that things are good, even if they don't feel it yet. Overseas, it was Ukraine first, but his dig was for Trump. It was a long ago when a Republican president named Ronald Reagan thundered, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. Now my predecessor, a former Republican president, tells Putin, quote, do whatever the hell you want. 
That's a quote. But the Middle East, Gaza and Israel, that came at the end. Tonight, I'm directing the U.S. military to lead an emergency mission to establish a temporary pier in the Mediterranean on the coast of Gaza. To the leadership of Israel, I say this. Humanitarian assistance cannot be a secondary consideration or a bargaining chip. Was this a reset moment? Well, he was uncharacteristically fluent, energetic, but he failed to paint a picture of an America capable of healing or coming together, such as the State of the Union right now. Mark Stone, Sky News in Washington. Well, let's speak now to our Middle East correspondent, Alistair Bunkle, who's in Jerusalem for us this morning. Hello to you, Alistair. So what do you think that Israel will make of what President Biden said overnight, as well as his plans to build this new port in Gaza? Well, I mean, concerning the port, I think the Americans will say that this is a sign of U.S. leadership. I think others will say it's a sign that U.S. leadership has failed on Gaza. I think what it certainly is, is an indication that American pressure to try and persuade their ally to let more humanitarian aid in, for example, and other areas of the war, well, it, it hasn't really worked, or at least it hasn't worked sufficiently enough. Uh, we have all seen um, the increasing desperation in Gaza. We've seen the pictures coming out of Gaza of people long queues for food, fighting for food, fighting for aid, fighting to stay alive. And, you know, those are watched by the White House every bit as much as they are watched by civilians around the world. And America is now looking to act and perhaps take matters into its own hands. I thought it was interesting that Biden said that the US military would lead this effort, suggesting that others would be involved. We don't know who yet, but given that uh, it looks like a sort of staging post uh, for maritime aid will be Cyprus, which is a couple of hundred miles to the northwest of here. Perhaps, given the British military presence there, there might be British military involvement. This is a step forward for delivering humanitarian aid into Gaza, but it's not going to happen overnight. It will take many weeks at least, and it comes with all sorts of other questions as to who is going to distribute the aid, who is going to manage security on the ground, because Biden's been clear there'll be no US troops on the ground in Gaza itself. Yes, indeed. So uh, many questions, um, some of which may be answered in the days ahead. But Alistair, for now, thanks very much indeed. Now, here, a group of MPs have warned that the Ministry of Defence has no credible plan for funding the future of Britain's armed forces. So let's get more on this with our security and defence editor, Deborah Haynes, who's here. Hi there, Deborah. Um, this is the Public Accounts Committee, isn't it? So what is it that they're saying? Well, they're saying that basically we're, we're like a busted flush. Um, that we have every year since 2012, the, uh, the, the, the Ministry of Defence has um, been told to produce a 10-year equipment plan to show how it's fully funded, um, all of the things it wants to buy from like boots to warships. And this was all a legacy of uh, the Conservatives when they came to power, absolutely slating the previous Labour government for leaving uh, the armed forces with a massive black hole. It's like a £30 billion black hole. Where are we now? Um, um, many years later, the armed forces with a massive black hole. Like, nothing's changed except the size of the armed forces has been shrunk hugely by the Conservatives over their time in power to try to make the aspiration meet what the funding envelope is. And the Public Accounts Committee is saying that you know, this, this huge hole, is, it's, they're saying it's £16.9 billion funding gap, which actually could be at least as big as about £29 billion if you take in all the equipment that the army actually wants as opposed to what it can afford. Um, they're saying that, that it, you know, a massive element of this cost pressure comes from the nuclear deterrent programme, which is being renewed at the moment, our fleet of nuclear armed submarines, the warheads and the missiles that they use as well, by a staggering £38 billion increase in cost uh, over the next 10 years. Um, and they're saying if they don't get a grip and cut programmes, um, then we are really alarmingly exposed. The Ministry of Defence has said, however, as it always does, that everything's fine and we've got all the armed forces that we need to keep Britain safe and we're spending however many hundreds of billions of pounds on the equipment programme. OK, interesting to hear what the government says. We'll be talking to a minister shortly. Um, thanks very much indeed, Deborah. Thank you. Last weekend, a seven-year-old girl became the latest victim of the perilous journey across the Channel. The migrant boat she and her family were travelling in capsized in northern France. Rouart was one of 16 passengers on board, and despite their personal tragedy, 
the parents are still planning to attempt the crossing again. They've been talking to our Europe correspondent, Adam Parsons. Rua was seven years old. Her life spent moving through Europe on a long journey towards the UK, a journey that ended with her death. <laughs> she was beautiful. I lost her from my hands, my little princess. <laughs> She was seven years old. She'd seen nothing in this world. We wanted to make their lives better. Rua's family had paid a people smuggler to take them to Britain, but the boat capsized and Rua drowned. <laughs> Those people are criminals. They do not see humans as humans. They only see money. They treat humans like objects. They have no morals, ethics or humanity. Bewildered in grief, Rua's three brothers. She was very dear to us, but she's gone now. And I want her to come back, but she won't. This wasn't a normal channel crossing attempt. The family had boarded a small stolen riverboat 12 miles inland from the French coastline. <laughs> Collecting her body from a morgue, Rua's family dreading the farewell to come. As they left, Rua's small wooden coffin followed behind. There was little time to linger. Muslim tradition dictates burials must take place before sunset. We often talk about the dangers of cross-channel migration, that this is what it looks and feels like when things go terribly wrong. A bereaved, devastated family, a local community trying to offer solace, and at the heart of it, the grave of a seven-year-old girl. Her family say they are hollow with grief, but that they still plan on getting to Britain, and that will mean another smuggler and another dangerous boat. Adam Parsons, Sky News, Dunkirk. The family of a former American footballer who shot dead six people before taking his own life, so they're going to sue the NFL. Philip Adams' family claim his death was caused by head injuries that he suffered during his sporting career. Our US correspondent Martha Kellner has more. Philip Adams had a very successful NFL career. He played for numerous teams between 2010 and 2016, uh, the likes of the San Francisco 49ers, the New England Patriots. But five years after he retired, he committed the most horrific crime. He shot dead six people at a house in South Carolina, including a prominent local doctor, Robert Leslie, his wife, Barbara, their two grandchildren aged just five and nine years old and two gentlemen who were working on the house at the time. After a standoff with police, he then turned the gun on himself, took his own life. And his family at the time said that they believed what he did that day was linked to his football career. They sent his brain off to be analysed and it returned findings of a severe case of CTE. Now, CTE is a brain disease. It's linked to a history of traumatic head injuries and they're now suing, I understand, they're suing the NFL in a wrongful death lawsuit. It's a highly significant legal move. It's also one that could be very costly for the NFL and it takes place against this backdrop of growing calls for more investigation into potential links between head injuries in contact sports and violent crime. It's something I've been investigating. And just this week, there was uh, the findings came back on the brain of Robert Card, the, the man who shot dead 18 people uh, in the state of Maine last October. It showed that he didn't have CT, but he did have a history uh, of traumatic brain injuries. Now, uh, with regards to Philip Adams' case, I have contacted the NFL for comment. They've not yet responded. Martha Kellner in the US there. Now, 287 students have been kidnapped by gunmen in northwestern Nigeria. Local people said the abductors surrounded a school as pupils were about to start their day. It is the second mass abduction in the country 
in less than a week. Let's take a look now at what the weather's up to. Warm memories wherever you go. To fly, to fly, the weather, to fly. sponsored by Qatar Airways. Well, easterly winds will pick up today, gusting over the southwest, parts of Wales, and to the lee of high ground. Well, temperatures will be close to average for the time of year, but it will feel considerably colder. There'll be a patchy frost to start the day, but there'll be sunshine for Western Scotland and much of England and Wales. Early showers over Scotland should die away. Southern parts of the country will see temperatures reaching a high of 12 degrees Celsius, but values will remain in single figures for much of the country. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Time now to speak to the government this morning. I'm joined, as you can see, by Gareth Davis, the Exchequer Secretary to the Treasury. Uh, he's here with me now. Very good morning to you. Thanks so much for coming in. Um, some news just in the last few minutes, really. Uh, the decision by Theresa May to, to stand down at the next election. What's your reaction to that? Well, how appropriate. On International Women's Day, the uh, country's second female Prime Minister is standing down after a pretty good innings, 27 years of service, not just to her constituents, but I think as one of our longest serving Home Secretaries and then obviously Prime Minister as well. Uh, I'm personally sad to see her go. I think it's uh, very good when former leaders uh, stay in the House of Commons and contribute to debates and she's certainly brought a lot to uh, debates since she stood down and so um, I'm very sad personally but wish her well and uh, I think she's uh, justified in, in moving on after 27 years. I think that makes it close to 60 Tory MPs. That's around a sixth of the party choosing to stand down at the next election. It sounds like there are a lot of Tory MPs have, that have made their minds up about the party's prospects in the next election. I think there's nearly 50 Labour MPs as well, just to be uh, completely balanced about this. And this is what happens when you approach a new election uh, and completely uh, reasonable for people to decide that it's time to go, particularly when they've been in the House of Commons for a long time. And uh, each one has made their own decision for personal reasons, and I respect every single person's decision to do so. OK, uh, another bit of news um, for, for you to respond to, if you will. Um, the US ha has announced in the last few hours that it's going to construct a port in Gaza to try to get humanitarian aid in. Uh, do you welcome that? And is there any UK involvement in this? Uh, so I don't have details of any UK involvement, but I will say this, that it is a complete priority for not just the Foreign Secretary, but the Prime Minister to focus on uh, the conflict in, in the Middle East. We continue to press for a humanitarian uh, pause, as we've uh, said consistently. We've got to get the hostages out and get aid in. And so uh, we're working uh, very hard to ensure that that can happen, not just with uh, Israel, but with the United States and our other allies too. Are you frustrated with the amount of aid that's getting in and how Israel's handling it? Well, anybody watching the scenes um, uh, in Gaza uh, can't help but notice how horrific it is. And so we've been very clear that we need to get aid into uh, Gaza. We've tripled the amount of aid that we're providing uh, to the conflict. Uh, and we've been also very clear that we need as many crossings open as possible. And we will continue to press uh, for that to happen. Uh, I want to talk to you about defence spending because the Public Accounts Committee has produced a report today saying that there's a financial black hole worth billions and billions of pounds in defence spending and they say that the government currently lacks a credible plan to fund the Ministry of Defence. So what have you got to say to that? Well, we've got record funding going into our defence. It's vital that we do that, the war in Ukraine. Uh, showed how important it is that we have a resilient and ready armed forces uh, because you never know where the next conflict is around uh, the corner. We've got, I think, over £50 billion being spent uh, this year on defence. It was uplifted by £11 billion at the last spring budget. And so money is going into our defences. But the nature of conflict has also changed in that we need technology and we, knew, we need different, a different way of... Uh, tackling uh, conflict and being ready to do so. But the Public Accounts Committee says that the money just simply isn't there. They say that there is no credible plan to deliver fully funded military capability as desired 
by you, by the government, and they say that leaves us in an alarming place. Well, I, I don't recognise that. As I say, we've got record funding going into defence. It was uplifted £11 billion, uh, last year. And we have a spending review that will take place uh, next year where you know, defence spending will be reviewed again. Uh, but I, I don't accept that. I think there is a significant amount of funding going into defence. And as I say, the nature of conflict has changed as such that it requires spending in a different way. But they say there's a shortfall of billions compared to what you say that you want to do. They say that, that that money just isn't there and there's been no new money announced in the budget at a time of huge global tension. Well, we are one of the first, uh, well, I think one of the only countries uh, to be uh, meeting our uh, NATO uh, target of 2%. We're the only political party, by the way, that has an ambition to get to 2.5% of GDP on defence spending when it's responsible to do so. But as I say, there is billions of pounds going into our defence budget, not least with an uplift last year of 11 billion into it. So when will you help hit that target of 2.5% of GDP? Well, it's, it's a long-term ambition that we want to make sure that we can do so responsibly and in a sustained way but as I say, we are the only ones uh, that have committed to doing that. And yet, if you don't have a plan, it, it, it means that people are left in the dark. And this, this plays into what the Institute for Fiscal Studies said yesterday. He said that you and Labour are in a conspiracy of silence over tax and spending choices. They're pointing out that the next government's going to inherit some really tough spending choices. Um, are you being honest about your ambitions, how much they're going to cost and where the money's going to be coming from? Yes, we've been very clear that we want uh, spending to increase over the next parliament by a percent in real terms every single year. The OBR have been also very clear in their report uh, alongside the budget that overall total spending will go up by £86 billion, which would be a record amount for total government spending. When it comes to departmental spending, that is a process that takes place as part of a spending review, as they know well, and that is right that that takes place after the election when a government has a mandate from the British people to decide those kind of budgets. But doesn't the public need to know more about what those choices are and, and have more clar clarity about your ambitions? For example, national insurance. Let's see if we can get a bit of clarity on that as well. Two different ministers have given Sky News a rather different take on your ambitions for national insurance. Uh, one of your Treasury colleagues has said that, that you're going to phase it out completely. Another, Mel Stride, Work and Pension Secretary, has said that it's his understanding that it's the government's aspiration to bring it and taxes more generally down over time. So which is it? What is the government's plan? So the, the starting point is that we think there's a fundamental unfairness that if you work in a job, you pay two types of tax. You pay income tax and you pay national insurance contributions. And so what we want to do and what we've demonstrated in the last two fiscal uh, uh, events is that we want to get national insurance uh, contributions down to the extent that we remove the unfairness over time. So the long-term ambition, the long-term ambition, it may take several parliaments, but the long-term ambition is to remove that unfairness, absolutely. And if you just look at our actions in the last six months, we've already reduced it by some, uh, I think, 30%. A third of it has gone down as a result of Jeremy Hunt's last two fiscal events. So that is our plan. That is an ambition. Do you want to merge national insurance and income tax? Well, we keep all these things under review, but we want to remove the unfairness of having two taxes for those in work. That's why we've, uh, by the way, uh, cut tax for those in work. Some 29 million people will benefit as a result of the tax cut of the spring budget, just as they did in the autumn statement. As I say, it's been reduced by 30%. We want to keep going with that. OK, Gareth Athers, I'm just going to pick you up on something you said earlier. I'm being told that the number of Labour MPs who are standing down at, at the next election is, is more like 17 rather than close to 50. Um, but we'll, we'll go away and have a look at that. OK, um, maybe have a look. OK, yeah. uh, but Gareth Davis, we appreciate your time. Thanks very much Thank you. indeed. Thank you. Uh, so we will actually be talking to um, the, uh, Meg Hillier from the uh, Public Accounts Committee a little bit later on about uh, that report that she's put out today about defence spending and what she says is a big financial black hole in it. Uh, she is saying that the government lacks a credible plan to fund the Ministry of Defence, so we'll put some of what the Minister said uh, to her there. Um, and this is um, shaping up to be a bit of a row. We've got um, our political correspondent, uh, Rob Powell, here. Um, 
tell us a little bit about the background to this and, and what the Public Accounts Committee is saying today, Rob. Yeah, this is um, the report that Deborah was talking about earlier, essentially the black hole in, in defence um, spending between what they need to meet their uh, aims and what money is currently there at the MOD. What you got from the Treasury Minister there was essentially sort of accentuating the positives, if you like. It is true that quite a lot more money has gone into defence, but it's also true that compared to um, what many people say is needed, given global instability, it's nowhere near. Uh, and I think that is one of those areas where the IFS have identified those independent economists where there's essentially a bit of a conspiracy of silence. And I think you saw that in that interview there when Gareth Davis talked about 2.5% of GDP on defence being a long-term ambition that we'll achieve in a responsible and sustained way. So not really any timeline there or detail. The other part of that I thought was really interesting was when he talked about potentially getting rid of national insurance. And he put a timeline on that. He said that this may take several parliaments to achieve so you're talking a 10, 15 year long ambition there. That seems to be a rapid watering down um, of some of the briefing and some of the statements that we were getting from ministers in the wake of the budget. So this might not even be something that is achieved over the next parliament if the Conservatives are elected. We may be waiting decades for this. And then the very final thing on what you picked up Gareth Davis on at the end, uh, connected to Theresa May, he said that uh, 50 Labour MPs were standing down. The number is actually 16 or 17. It's not 50. Yeah, thanks for that, that, that update. Someone doing some counting behind the scenes <laughs> for me there. Very useful. But uh, interesting that Theresa May is standing down. Yes. I'm sure we'll, we'll hear more about that through the day as well. Yeah. Uh, Rob, thanks very much indeed. Uh, we've got lots coming up for you here on The Breakfast Show, so don't go anywhere. Uh, Joe Biden confirms plans to build a temporary aid port on the coast of Gaza, but who's going to distribute supplies? We'll get the thoughts of our security and defence analyst, Michael Clark. And we've got the sport for you, and there was a close call for Lewis Hamilton in practice for the Saudi Arabian Grand Prix.
Hello, welcome back. A big speech overnight by President Biden, of course, at that kind of time that's quite difficult to watch if you're in the UK. Mm. I think it's about two o'clock in the morning, isn't it? Well, if you're getting up like we are, then, of course, we're, we're across it all the time. But it's one of those ones, isn't it? You go to bed and you're reading the previews and then you're getting up and seeing the reviews and, and we're discussing it. And I think with President Biden at the moment, everyone's a little bit on tenterhooks as to whether he's going to get the words out right. Everyone's certainly watching for mistakes, Yes. Aren't they? And apparently he didn't. We were speaking the last hour to, to a guest saying that he got someone's name wrong in the name of a, a victim uh, of, uh, of a crime, which is it's not a great look. And, of course, the Republicans will seize on that kind of thing, won't they? They will. Yeah. They certainly will. Uh, let's get to our top stories, though. And, yes, Joe Biden has confirmed plans to build a temporary port as well to increase deliveries of humanitarian aid to the people of Gaza. In his State of the Union address, the US president also urged Congress to continue supporting Ukraine in its war against Russia and said history is watching. The family of a seven-year-old girl who died trying to cross the channel say the migrant boat they were travelling on was unfit for purpose and that people smugglers have no morals. Rua was one of 16 passengers on a makeshift vessel that capsized in northern France last weekend. MPs are warning that the government has no credible plan to fund the armed forces and that the UK has become increasingly reliant on its allies. The Public Accounts Committee has accused the Ministry of Defence of putting off painful decisions about where to make cuts. And the former Prime Minister, Theresa May, has announced she will stand down as an MP at the next general election. In a statement to her local paper, Mrs May said she wanted to focus on causes close to her heart, including her work on tackling modern slavery and human trafficking. Well, let's get more on Joe Biden's plan to build a temporary aid port off the coast of Gaza. We can get the uh, reaction of our security and defence analyst, Professor Michael Clark, who joins me now. Very good morning to you, Michael. Nice to see you. Um, so what do you make of this announcement by President Biden to build this temporary port? How do you think it'll work? Yeah, it's been thought about before, Anna. There is a port um, at Gaza City. There's a port for Gaza City, which is really just a fishing port, very small, and the Israelis made sure it never developed into anything. And there was some thinking before that, that aid could be delivered um, through that port, but it would have to be expanded. It, it's there, but it needs more facility. It needs unloading facilities. So it is possible. <clears throat> the fact that the United States now want to do it, as it were, you know, in the teeth of the operation of one of their closest allies, Israel, Israel, as if they're, they're moving into this port, as if it's in a hostile territory. I mean, that's a big political message. But this is sheer frustration on the part of Washington that uh, the Netanyahu government will not facilitate the delivery of adequate aid. So they're saying, OK, well, we'll do it as if this was now a hostile environment. And they can certainly do it. Uh, it'll take a little while um, to get some facilities in place. But there are also the United States has got ships, uh, as has Britain, if they're available, to deliver material to the beaches. But if you're going to get um, tonnages in, which is what they need to do, the equivalent of 500 trucks a day, then you've got to have proper unloading facilities and probably some new jetties built, temporary jetties, um, on the, the fishing port that's there. So, yes, it can be done. But yes, it's a big symbol of the, of the discordance between Washington and Israel at the moment. And the US said that this will involve no American boots on the ground. Does it risk, though, the Americans getting drawn into this war in any way, do you think? Uh, yes, it does, to an extent. I mean, there, there won't be any boots on the ground, but there'll certainly be a lot of, a lot of um, sailors <laughs> who are involved in engineers who are involved just offshore. Um, and, of course, there will be some people on the ground uh, at, the, at the ferry, at the little fishing port itself. Um, it, it may be a temptation to Hamas to take a few pot shots at them, so they'll need to be protected. So there'll be some protection assets set around the construction efforts that will have to go on to make this, this little area um, more viable. Um, but that's not the same as, as boots on the ground, people, as it were, moving into Gaza to take over any military role. But the temptation... Um, of either uh, Hamas, uh, who you know are not fully in control of what they do, or um, the um, uh, Palestinian Islamic Jihad, um, who are the sort of offshoot of Hamas, who are wilder, uh, if that's possible. The temptation for some of them to fire some rockets at American ships offshore might also be something they'll succumb to. So the Americans will have to be careful uh, as they do this. And I'm sure there will be incidents of some sort uh, as this goes forward.
And Michael, I wonder if I can just get your thoughts on another story that we're covering today, and this is the Public Accounts Committee saying that the Ministry of Defence has no credible plan uh, to fund the armed forces that the government wants. I wonder what your reaction is when you hear that. Yeah, I, I mean, it's the it's nothing but the truth. Um, I mean, we're spending fifty five billion a year on defence. Um, but the, and the, the government is saying, well, that's a real terms increase, but it isn't really because they're including in that some of the contingency funding for the dreadnought nuclear program as we're bringing forward the extra reserve to make it look as if the budget is bigger. That includes money for Ukraine, includes money to replace ammunition that we've sent to Ukraine. The reality is that um, we spend most uh, we spend a, 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 a most of our extra money for defense on equipment and on capital and day-to-day -day running costs are being cut all the time and they're being being cut consistently now for well over a decade so what that leaves us with is as i always say we've we've got a military that's all in the shop window nothing in the storeroom so we look pretty good if you just look at what's in the shop window what in theory we can do and we can do things with our air and, and sea uh, forces and with our ground forces, we, but we can do them once for a short period. And the truth is, and this is just a very hypothetical exercise, if you set it to um, you know, soldiers at the staff college as a, as a job to say, if we had to send our army to the continent to fight the Russians without allies helping to protect it, what would happen? And I'll tell you what would happen, that we'd lose it all in an afternoon. Um, it has no air defence. So if we did send our army on its own without Allied support to fight against a, what they call a peer power, a power as good as we are or nearly as in the same sort of tier as we are, then the fact is we, we uh, our forces would be wildly vulnerable to the drones and the aircraft and the missiles that are out there against which we have plans but no real acquisition process to do something about. We won't do something about it on present plans until sometime in the 2030s. OK, well, Professor Michael Clark, always interesting to get your thoughts. Uh, thanks very much indeed for joining us this morning. Thank you. Now then, James is here with all the sport. Um, I, di I live with Liverpool fans. Hey. I can't help... Oh, you're Great a Liverpool news. fan. I'm We're not biased on this channel at all. But um, a, lot, a lot of celebration. I always notice a Liverpool result when it's like that. <laughs> like Liverpool fan TV. Sorry. <laughs> this morning, it feels like. It's a, it's a good morning to be a Liverpool fan. They're doing very well. Good result last night, build yeah. it up. You're nervous about the weekend, though. That's the big one, isn't it? Well, I, th I think any Liverpool fan watching and, and any Man City fan watching as well will be aware of Liverpool's injury problems. And I know you're going to mention the score in a minute, uh, James, but Ibrahima Kanate got injured last night. He's been playing really well at, at centre-half. So City fans will be happy about that as they go to Anfield at the weekend. You'll be fine, don't worry. It's OK, I'll hold you to that. Pre-match nerves, that's all it is. Says the uh, resident you've done, you've done your steps today already. We've been talking about 10,000 steps a day. I've done at least 10. Yeah. I've walked over here. You walk that do, way, do this way, this way. Better than me. I've done maybe 50 today. I've done about 50. Got okay. a lot of catching up to do. We have. We've got a long day ahead of us, that's for sure. <laughs> and we're not the only ones with a long day ahead, actually. England have got a long day ahead of them in the fifth and final test match against India. India are building for a very, very heavy lead. An update of the score coming up. This Sky News Sports Bulletin is brought to you by Vitality. Getting more people, more active. Live life with Vitality. Now, this signifies a corner, OK? I don't want this and I don't want that. I need to hand up here. OK, that is contested. It's school on a Sunday, but nobody's complaining because the lesson is the laws of the game and the classroom is Villa Park. The FA wants to find 1,000 new black, Asian and mixed heritage referees from different communities around the country. It's part of the reflective and representative campaign. We want to increase the pool of referees from these communities at a grassroots level with the hope that in the future that these individuals can then go through the referee and progression pathway and then eventually uh, referee within the Women's Super League and in the Premier League. Historically, maybe the interest wasn't there, but actually we haven't probably done enough to actually showcase what refereeing is about. You're going to go there and blow, blow the whistle and give a direct free kick. A lot of challenges that people talked about, the themes were, you know, referee courses were too expensive, 
Um, and that's why we've employed a bursary scheme as part of this campaign. You two go. Going into grassroots football and going into it as a referee, um, with all the other challenges that I have, uh, the other added challenge will be um, the, the, the discrimination angle. You need to blow the whistle and put your hand like this. It's got to be like this on every single cone. The achievements of Sam Ellison, Rebecca Welsh and Sonny Singil have highlighted the importance of role models and mentors within refereeing, with new refs coming through having people to aspire to. The organisation BAMREF was set up to increase levels of representation in refereeing and we're in attendance on the day. Straight arm out. Well, I've never seen this before. It's absolutely amazing to be part of a room full of young, black, Asian, mixed heritage, uh, young people ready to start their refereeing journey. Do you remember when you first stepped into a room ready to do a referee call? I was the only female and I was the only black and Asian uh, mixed heritage of that community. To see this happening right now, this is what we need. We need people to feel that they belong in refereeing. And we're going to stop, blow and give a penalty. Yeah, still got it there. What I'm really, really um, so pleased to, about today is the fact that we've got a huge, wide, wide range, young 16-year-olds all the way up to adults really 12 years ago it was literally I walked into the room and it was a room full of about 45 people and I was the only person of colour. When you look at the makeup of the football clubs the players themselves they, there's a very wide diverse background but actually onto the field of play as the officials no there isn't. Over 200 people accessed the bursary scheme between September and January with more to be added across 13 courses over February. Referee courses can cost up to £140, but were lowered to 40 this time round. I want to broaden my knowledge in football and um, in future I wish to have a full-time career in football in some aspect, whether that's refereeing, coaching or whatever, but um, I just want to be involved in football because I love the game. What I like about refing is that you don't have to be a great player or anything, it's just about showing your leadership skills and also enjoying the game alongside the players. I'm enjoying how it's like teaching people in like independence and things and I, I quite like how I'll be able to, to choose like what matches I go to and work on my own time schedule. What would the dream be in refereeing for you? Champions League final. The Champions League is the dream, Sunday League is the start. It's time to stop the caution on new faces in refereeing. Chris Reedy, Sky Sports. Leo, Hattie, Steve, Lachlan, thanks for joining me in Sky Sports News for this chat around uh, LGBT History Month. All of you, really, why did you sort of set up and get involved in the LGBT cricket groups that you're here representing today? And it was during COVID, actually, that, you know, it became very clear for members of the LGBTQ community. This Sky News Sports Bulletin is brought to you by Vitality. Thanks very much indeed, James. Still to come here on The Breakfast Show. More support for Ukraine, but is it enough to help beat Putin? We'll speak to Ukrainian human rights lawyer next. in the world. I'm Alex Crawford and I'm Sky's special correspondent based in Istanbul. This is going to be the biggest party Tripoli has ever seen. That's it. it, it got us then. There's a lot of action going on. A lot of heat in still. We aim to be the best and the most trusted place in news. Look at her arms, I can put my entire hand round. 
This is the cocktail of drugs which the doctors at this hospital have been giving their coronavirus patients. Made for people who want clarity in an uncertain world. Mother Nature is, can be vicious, absolutely savage. The world's largest falls now down to a trickle in places. I can't imagine how much plastic is lying at the bottom of this huge lake. Whoa! <laughs> Close and personal with the rhino. This is what makes the job so fantastic. Now, the UK has announced another tranche of support for Ukraine, this time in the form of thousands of military drones to help target Russia's naval forces in the Black Sea. But with President Putin's troops continuing to make advances in the east, is it too little too late? Well, I'm joined now by Ukrainian human rights lawyer and co-recipient of the 2022 Nobel Peace Prize, Alexandra Matvichuk. A very good morning to you. Thanks so much for coming in. I wanted to get your reaction, first of all, to what President Biden has said overnight in his State of the Union address. He warned that Vladimir Putin won't stop at Ukraine. Do you agree with him? Yes, I totally agree with this message. If we don't be able to stop Putin in Ukraine, he will go further. Because it's not just a war between two states, this is a war between two systems, authoritarianism and democracy. And this war started not in February 2022, but in February 2014, when Ukraine obtained the chance for the quick democratic transition after the collapse of the authoritarian regime due to revolution of dignity. Because only existence of free world always threatened dictatorship with a loss of power. And one of the reasons President, P President Biden is raising this is because there is money in Congress that is stalled that is intended for Ukraine. He wants to free that up. How concerned are you about that money not getting to Ukraine? It's a critical situation which we now appear to in the second anniversary of large-scale invasion because Putin is prepared for a long protractive war. Uh, only officially, Russia will spend more than 40% of their budget for military expenses. But military support for Ukraine in the United States is frozen. And that is why Putin again repeat publicly the genocidal claim that Ukrainians do not exist, that we are the same people as with Russians. And we, as a human rights docu lawyers, document for all these 10 years how these words implicated into practice when Ukrainians on the occupied territories have to be either re-educated or killed. Alexander, at the same time as US funding, US support is being frozen here today, there are discussions that we don't have the capacity to help support as much as perhaps people would have thought. The MOD, the Ministry of Defence here, says that our armed forces have a plan but don't really have the resources. So with the risk of a renewed spring offensive from Russia around the corner, what will the reaction in Kyiv and in Ukraine be to that? We want to survive and that is why we are trying to look to some other alternatives who can just temporarily help us. And one of such alternatives is 300 billion euro of uh, Russian frozen assets which is frozen in Western democracies. We have to confiscate these assets and to give it to Ukraine for our self-defense and recovery. But we are also hearing that Germany is being urged to do more. Our own Defence Secretary Grant Shapps is calling on them to 
send over long-range missiles. Do you think that the way things stand at the moment, that more NATO countries, with Sweden having just joined yesterday, could be stepping up and doing more to support Ukraine? Yes, we are waiting for Germany Taurus rockets. And every day of delay converted in numerous deaths of people in Ukraine, in battlefield, in occupied areas, in deep rear. But the problem is generally that still our partners very slowly changing their mind from narrative, let's help Ukraine not to fail, to the narrative, let's help Ukraine to win. Because there is a huge difference between let's help Ukraine not to fail and let's help Ukraine to win. OK, well, Oleksandra Mavichuk, we really appreciate you coming in to talk to us today. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you. Now it's time to talk to uh, Wilfred Frox. Frost, who's been keeping an eye on what uh, President Biden's been up to overnight. Uh, Wilf, I hope you haven't been up all night uh, watching President Biden, but what did you make of what he said? Well, first and foremost, Anna, welcome back. Great, great to see you. Um, I actually did watch a little bit of it because I couldn't sleep, um, and uh, I guess it wasn't captivating enough to keep me awake throughout the whole speech. But uh, listen, I think the most interesting thing, you were just discussing it there with your prior guest, was the extent to which he decided to focus on Ukraine funding. He opened the, the speech with that, and actually kind of came back to the global threats to democracy at the end of the speech. Uh, and the other thing I just note from that is it did get a largely warm reception and it reminds everyone that actually there's a, a big majority across members of Congress that do want to pass the Ukraine funding bill. It's just a section of the Republican Party who happen to have the majority in the House that don't. And most importantly, the Speaker, uh, who, who's from that faction that doesn't want to get that funding through, and he kind of controls the process. But uh, I, I do think it was interesting that he decided to, to lead the speech on that uh, and, and the reception it got. But it doesn't change the fact that, of course, the funding isn't passing. No, that's right. And I know that's something that you're going to be uh, focusing on a little bit later when you take over at 10. But for the moment, Will, we'll catch you later. But for the moment, thanks. Now it's Oscars on Sunday. Are you excited about the Oscars? I've barely seen any of the films. I think they're all too long. Oh, I like a long film. <laughs> Sorry to say that. <laughs> I can't do three Great hours Great critical judgment. <laughs> <laughs> I love the films. But I have to say that I haven't seen them all either. But uh, does the headline awards ceremony have an age gap problem? That's the question we're asking this morning. Our arts and entertainment correspondent Katie Spencer reports. A land of airbrushed perfection. Hollywood has always had an issue with ageing reflected in who wins what here. At the Oscars, typically it's been the young female ingenue rewarded, while the men alongside them get to mature like fine wines. I can tell even if I can't see, and I heard the word fat, fat and ugly. No one but me would dare, and I did not. The invisibility of middle-aged women on screen, not lost on 2019's winner. I don't stop watching telly once I'm 31, or films, or stories, or theatre. I still want to watch. Yeah. And, and although you don't pay us as much, <laughs> we still have some clout. So uh, don't estimate, underestimate women. But could the industry finally be turning a corner? Those still able to move an eyebrow might well want to raise one at Sky News' analysis of the Oscars acting categories this year. Take the average age of male winners over the decades and put them next to the women and note that crossover. Because of wins for older women at recent ceremonies, cemented last year with Michelle Yeoh and Jamie Lee Curtis winning, who are both in their 60s, it's meant the average age gap has closed for the first time. Technically taken this year alone and not the decade average, if winners go as predicted, there'll still be an acting age gap of 16 and a half years. But that's still way better than what was repeatedly going on in the 90s and noughties. Take the year 2000, for instance, when between Hilary Swank and Angelina Jolie, Kevin Spacey and Michael Caine, the average age gap was 29 years. Jodie Foster has experienced it all. A nominee aged 14, winning twice before she was 30. What you want to do has never been done. I mean, especially not for a woman. Now, over 30 years later, she's up for an Oscar again for a film about endurance swimmer Diana Nyad. The world of complexity hasn't always been reserved for women, you know? We were the mother of, the sister of, the prostitute of, you know? It, it, it has taken a lot of work by women to flesh out female characters in the industry over time. While it's too early to say for certain whether Hollywood's ironed out the wrinkles in its age gap problem, taking the overall picture by decade, for the first time, progress. Katie Spencer, Sky News.
Let's take a look now at what the weather's up to. Warm memories wherever you go. To fly, to fly. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Well, easterly winds will pick up today, gusting over the southwest, parts of Wales, and to the lee of high ground. Temperatures will be close to average for the time of year, but it will feel considerably colder. There'll be a patchy frost to start the day, but there'll be sunshine for Western Scotland as well as much of England and Wales. Early showers over Scotland should die away. Southern parts of the country will see temperatures reaching a high of 12 degrees Celsius. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. So we were talking about uh, the Oscars ju there just a moment ago, and you've picked out a story in the papers about yeah, it's film, at least. hidden away in the Times, um, saying that Killian Murphy, the star of Oppenheimer, of course, has been tipped by the bookies to potentially be the next Bond. But they've got a quote here from the spokesman for the James Bond International Fan Club saying that they don't think that's the case, that auditions haven't started yet. And anyway, he hasn't got, as they put it, the Goldilocks level of stardom. Not too much, not too little, just about right. So he's too famous, they're saying. Too famous and maybe a little bit too old as well, at 47, to do a few films. That's not too old. That's, that, <laughs> How old are you? I'm exactly 47. So I you're, think out I... the, you're out of the running as well, Matt, so <laughs> don't expect a call. <laughs> by famous, your, by your judgment, Rob, I think I'm at peak performance right now. <laughs> I, think, uh, I think Killian Murphy's more of a baddie, though, isn't he? I think that's the true thing about <gasps> Killian Murphy. I think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Too old at 47, that's really worrying. Anyway, <laughs> top stories coming up next. Don't go away.
Hello, a very good morning. It's eight o'clock. Coming up on today's show, Joe Biden declares democracy is under attack at home and abroad in a flagship speech as he confirms plans to deliver aid to Gaza via the sea. Plus, the ballooning black hole in funding for the UK's armed forces. The Treasury tell us they don't recognise those claims. We'll hear Labour's take shortly. And in sport, India looked set to build a big first in his lead over England in the fifth test. It's Friday the 8th of March. President Biden says history is watching in his State of the Union address with attacks on Donald Trump, Vladimir Putin and a stark caution for Israel's leadership. Humanitarian assistance cannot be a secondary consideration or a bargaining chip. Protecting and saving innocent lives has to be a priority. It's a message that will be received with some concern here in Israel, I think, where there remains a huge dependence on US security. After 27 years in Parliament and a challenging three in number 10, former Prime Minister Theresa May announces her intention to stand down. Sky News hears the anger of a family who paid thousands to people smugglers to reach Britain, only for their daughter to drown in the Channel. She was seven years old. She'd seen nothing in this world. We wanted to make their lives better. MPs warn that the UK has no plan to properly fund the armed forces as the MOD's budget deficit balloons to a potential £29 billion. And Liverpool have one foot in the Europa League quarterfinals after thrashing Sparta Prague 5-1. Hello, a very good morning. Thanks so much for joining us here on Breakfast. Our top story here this morning, in the year that we'll see him go head-to-head -head with Donald Trump once again, Joe Biden made his pitch to American voters overnight, declaring that freedom and democracy were under attack, both at home and abroad. His State of the Union address was a broadside of both his predecessor and President Putin. There was also a caution to the United States chief ally, Israel, over the worsening humanitarian crisis in Gaza, as he confirmed plans to deliver aid via the sea. Our US correspondent, Mark Stone, reports. President, how are you feeling, sir? Feeling good. It had been billed by his own side as a reset moment, a chance for the president to show a nation on prime time that the State of the Union is good under him. But even his journey there was to be complicated. Well, the president's due to drive down here, down Pennsylvania Avenue to Capitol Hill to make this all-important State of the Union address. It's been described as a make-or-break moment, and this is one of so many challenges that he faces. He avoided them, took another route to the hill, to the podium. No, it may not look like it, but I've been around a while. <laughs> When you get to be my age, certain things become clearer than ever. This is not traditionally the moment for partisan speeches, but he couldn't or wouldn't avoid it. Donald Trump on his mind, if not by name, throughout. Now my predecessor, my predecessor, my predecessor, my predecessor, my predecessor came to office determined to see Roe v. Wade overturned. Abortion was a key issue. Many of you in this chamber and my predecessor are promising to pass a national ban on reproductive freedom. My God, what freedom else would you take away? <laughs> and then an eyeballing for the justices who had restricted national abortion rights two years ago. With all due respect, justices, women are not without electoral or political power. You're about to realize just how much you were right about that. There was heckling from the right. I as he chastised them for blocking his immigration legislation, even though it was legislation they had wanted. On the economy, he tried to persuade the American people that things are good, even if they don't feel it yet. Overseas, it was Ukraine first, but his dig was for Trump. It wasn't long ago when a Republican president named Ronald Reagan thundered, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. Now my predecessor, 
A former Republican president tells Putin, quote, do whatever the hell you want. That's a quote. But the Middle East, Gaza and Israel, that came at the end. Tonight, I'm directing the U.S. military to lead an emergency mission to establish a temporary pier in the Mediterranean on the coast of Gaza. For the leadership of Israel, I say this. Humanitarian assistance cannot be a secondary consideration or a bargaining chip. Was this a reset moment? Well, he was uncharacteristically fluent, energetic, but he failed to paint a picture of an America capable of healing or coming together, such as the State of the Union right now. Mark Stone, Sky News in Washington. We're going to speak to our Middle East correspondent, Alistair Bunkle, who's in Jerusalem for us this morning. Hi there, Alistair. What do you think that Israel's reaction will be to what President Biden has said overnight, as well as these plans to build a port in Gaza? Well, Israel has um, reacted to the news of the port and said they, they welcome uh, that decision by the United States. But I think it remains to be seen. I mean, there's so many questions around it. Um, but one of those is, what role will Israel play in it, uh, if at all? Because I think you'd have to assume that there'll be some degree of security cooperation uh, between the Americans and others and the Israelis on the ground in Gaza. But this is, some people will say that this shows American leadership. Others will say it shows a failure of American leadership. I think it definitely shows that uh, the US has failed to persuade its ally Israel to get more humanitarian aid into Gaza because if they had been successful then I think we would have already seen uh, more land routes opened up, more border crossings opened up, which is possible. The Israelis have told us it's possible but they're not doing it. And so they're now having to, the Americans and others, having to explore this maritime corridor which I think would start in Cyprus uh, the port of Larnaca there that's got some pretty sophisticated scanning uh, technology. There's, there are Israelis based there as well, so they could scan the aid and, and do checks on it before it then made the journey across. But the, the question is, is how do you build this port, probably more like a pier. Um, America said there'll be no US boots on the ground in Gaza, um, but who's going to receive the aid? Who's going to then distribute the aid success, um, effectively? Who's going to secure the area uh, to make sure that you don't have chaotic scenes there? And how quickly is it going to be done? Because even if it's done at rapid pace, it's probably going to take a number of weeks. And for I think a lot of people in Gaza, they don't have a number of weeks. OK, Alistair, thanks very much indeed. Uh, one of the other bits of news that just broke just before we came on air, Matt, was about Theresa May signing down at the next election. Yes, and doing it quietly in her local yeah. paper, the Maidenhead Advertiser. Who knew that was the place to break news that you, as an ex-Prime Minister, are stepping down as an MP? That's right, but it, I suppose it says a lot about how she sees herself as a constituency MP, yeah. despite having been Prime Minister for three years. Absolutely. Locally focused yeah. and, uh, and low-key as well. But, uh, yeah, as Anna said there, former Prime Minister Theresa May has announced that she will stand down as a Member of Parliament at the next general election, whenever that may be. In a statement to that local paper, Mrs May said she wanted to focus on causes that are close to her heart, including her work on tackling modern slavery and human trafficking. Last weekend, a seven-year-old girl became the latest victim of the perilous journey across the Channel. The boat that she and her family were travelling in capsized in northern France. Ruart was one of 16 passengers on board the vessel, and despite their personal tragedy, her family say they're still planning to attempt that crossing again. They've been talking to our Europe correspondent, Adam Parsons. Rua was seven years old. Her life spent moving through Europe on a long journey towards the UK, a journey that ended with her death. <laughs> she was beautiful. I lost her from my hands, my little princess. She was seven years old. She'd seen nothing in this world. We wanted to make their lives better. <laughs> Rua's family had paid a people smuggler to take them to Britain, but the boat capsized and Rua drowned. Those people are criminals. They do not see humans as humans. They only see money. They treat humans like objects. They have no morals, ethics or humanity. <laughs> 
bewildered in grief, Rua's three brothers. She was very dear to us, but she's gone now, and I want her to come back, but she won't. This wasn't a normal channel crossing attempt. The family had boarded a small stolen riverboat 12 miles inland from the French coastline. <laughs> Collecting her body from a morgue, Rua's family dreading the farewell to come. As they left, Rua's small wooden coffin followed behind. There was little time to linger. Muslim tradition dictates burials must take place before sunset. We often talk about the dangers of cross-channel migration, that this is what it looks and feels like when things go terribly wrong. A bereaved, devastated family, a local community trying to offer solace, and at the heart of it, the grave of a seven-year-old girl. Her family say they are hollow with grief, but that they still plan on getting to Britain, and that will mean another smuggler and another dangerous boat. Adam Parsons, Sky News, Dunkirk. The family of a former American footballer who shot dead six people before taking his own life say they're going to sue the NFL. Philip Adams' family claim his death was caused by head injuries that he suffered during his sporting career. Our US correspondent Martha Kellner has more. Philip Adams had a very successful NFL career. He played for numerous teams between 2010 and 2016, uh, the likes of the San Francisco 49ers, the New England Patriots. But five years after he retired, he committed the most horrific crime. He shot dead six people at a house in South Carolina, including a prominent local doctor, Robert Leslie, his wife, Barbara, their two grandchildren aged just five and nine years old and two gentlemen who were working on the house at the time. After a standoff with police, he then turned the gun on himself, took his own life, and his family at the time said that they believed what he did that day was linked to his football career. They sent his brain off to be analysed and it returned findings of a severe case of CTE. Now, CTE is a brain disease. It's linked to a history of traumatic head injuries and they're now suing, I understand, they're suing the NFL in a wrongful death lawsuit. It's a highly significant legal move. It's also one that could be very costly for the NFL and it takes place against this backdrop of growing calls for more investigation into potential links between head injuries in contact sports and violent crime. It's something I've been investigating and just this week, there was uh, the findings came back on the brain of Robert Card, the, the man who shot dead 18 people uh, in the state of Maine last October. It showed that he didn't have CT, but he did have a history uh, of traumatic brain injuries. Now, uh, with regards to Philip Adams' case, I have contacted the NFL for comment. They've not yet responded. Martha Kellner there. Now 287 students have been kidnapped by gunmen in northwest Nigeria. Local people said the abductors surrounded a school as pupils were about to start the day. It is the second mass abduction in the country inside less than a week. Now, a group of MPs have warned that the Ministry of Defence has no credible plan for funding the future of Britain's armed forces and that the UK has become increasingly reliant on its allies. Uh, speaking to this programme in the last hour, the Treasury Minister, Gareth Davis, says he doesn't recognise those claims by the Public Accounts Committee. Got record funding going into defence. It was uplifted 11 billion uh, last year. And we have a spending review that will take place uh, next year where you know, defence spending will be reviewed again. Uh, but I, I don't accept that. I think there is a significant amount of funding going into defence. I think one of the only countries uh, to be 
uh, meeting our uh, NATO uh, target of 2%. We're the only political party, by the way, that has an ambition to get to 2.5% of GDP on defence spending when it's responsible to do so. But as I say, there is billions of pounds going into our defence budget, not least with an uplift last year of 11 billion into it. So when will you help hit that target of 2.5% of GDP? Well, it's, it's a long-term ambition that we want to make sure that we can do so responsibly and in a sustained way but as I say, we are the only ones uh, that have committed to doing that. Well, let's bring in our security and defence editor, Deborah Hain. So, Deborah, explain to us exactly what the Public Accounts Committee is saying today and its criticism over the funding of our armed forces. And, and what do you make of, of what the minister said there? Well, the criticism is very stark. And I find it extraordinary that the Treasury minister says he doesn't recognise the figures um, because these are... Um, clearly the available figures. It's in the Ministry of Defence's own equipment plan. He talked in that interview with you about this £11 billion that the government has given to defence. That is true. They announced that last year. But it's over five years, that money, and most of it is going into the nuclear deterrent, this big programme to renew our nuclear submarines, our nuclear armed submarines, and the missiles and warheads that go in them. And this Public Accounts Committee said that that programme alone, the cost estimate over the next 10 years, has grown by £38 billion. Inflation has um, pushed up the entire equipment programme by £10.9 billion. So the idea that you're throwing in a bit of a few more billions um, into the equipment programme and everything's going to be OK is utter nonsense, given the cost pressures that are on that programme. And the Public Accounts Committee, it's basically yet again sounding the alarm. This is nothing new. It happens every year. Um, the entire equipment plan, this 10-year programme, started in 2012 um, to try to put some kind of cost idea into the ambition of the armed forces to make sure that it matched the budget. It, it's, it's rarely ever done that. And now the deficit is the biggest it's ever been, £16.9 billion, potentially as much as about £29 billion. And that's because of the ambition that the armed forces have, that the government says it needs in terms of weapons in this increasingly dangerous world, do not match the amount of funding that the government has given to defence to deliver it. And we'll be speaking to the chair of that committee um, at about half past the hour. So interesting to see what she has to say about her report. Uh, Deborah, thanks very much indeed. Let's take a look now what the weather's doing. Warm memories wherever you go. To fly, to fly, the weather, to sponsored by Qatar Airways. Well, easterly winds will pick up today, gusting over the southwest, parts of Wales and to the lee of high ground. Temperatures will be close to average for the time of year, but it'll feel considerably colder. There'll be a patchy frost to start the day, but there'll be sunshine for western Scotland as well as much of England and Wales. Early showers over Scotland should die away. Southern parts of the country will see temperatures reaching a high of 12 degrees Celsius, but valleys will remain in single figures for much of the country. The Weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Well, I'm joined now by the Labour Party Chair and Shadow Women and Equalities Secretary Annalise Dodds for, for Labour's view on the, the stories of the day. Welcome to you. Thanks very much indeed for joining us. Um, a quick thought, first of all, uh, to the news that we heard this morning that Theresa May was standing down. What do you make of that? Yeah, good morning. I mean, I first of all, would of course want to wish her all the very best for the future. I think this is the end of an era. Theresa May has been in government for 20, or rather in parliament, for 27 years and, of course, held extremely high office as prime minister. I do think it's interesting, however, that we see, obviously, today, Theresa May saying that she'd stand down, but we've seen a really large number of other Conservative uh, members of parliament saying they'd stand down, including some MPs who've barely been in parliament for just a few Years. So there's quite a big exodus of Conservative MPs at the moment. And I think that just indicates that for many Conservatives as well as the country, now is the time for change. We do need to see that general election and we need to see it urgently. Well, 
Of course, Labour does want a general election, something that you do call for for most times that we chat. Uh, but let's um, also get your reaction to other news that we've uh, been covering that's been developing overnight. Um, the US are planning to build a, a port in Gaza to get more humanitarian aid in. Is that something that you welcome? Well, we're desperately concerned about the humanitarian catastrophe that's unrolling in Gaza. It really is a truly appalling situation. We're seeing now, as well as obviously the continued impact of fighting, real concerns about malnutrition uh, continuing within Gaza, particularly strong impact on children. And so Labour has consistently been calling for far stronger provision of aid to Gaza. We need to see much stronger action from the international community. But we have also said that we do need to see an immediate humanitarian ceasefire. Now, many countries are calling for this. Labour has added our voice to that call. Of course, Parliament did vote for that recently overall. We believe that's necessary so we can get the hostages out, so aid can be got in, and so there can actually be a political diplomatic process towards a two-state solution that's so necessary. OK, let me ask you about defence spending, because the Public Accounts Committee uh, has today raised concerns about what they say is a shortfall uh, being spent on defence. They say there's no credible plan to fund our armed forces or the armed forces that the country wants. Uh, are we spending enough on defence? Well, we are really concerned about the situation. When Labour left office in 2010, we were spending 2.5% of our GDP on defence, and throughout that period, we had an average of over 100,000 people within so our So what are your plans forces. were you to get into government? How much money would you spend on defence? So what we would do immediately is we would conduct a defence and security strategic review. Now, the government has not done that, so it doesn't have an accurate picture of exactly where there needs to be change, where there would need to be, for example, different approaches to spending. We've identified that there's been, unfortunately, a significant amount of waste in the government's approach. That's amounted to many billions of pounds. We've also identified that our brave armed forces far too often are living in appalling conditions. That's why we said there needs to be a focus on armed forces accommodation. So, of course, we would make sure the armed forces had the finances that they need. Okay. But we would also make sure that, ultimately, our brave members of the armed forces are treated properly and that that money is spent wisely because it has not been okay. spent wisely by the current government. So you're saying that you would spend the money to make sure that the armed forces uh, have what they need. So will you commit to, to spending 2.5% of GDP on defence? Well, that was ultimately the case when Labour left office in 2010, as I so said. So is it your ambition for well, the next parliament? Our ambition is to make sure that our armed forces are adequately funded and also that that funding and spending is allocated wisely. We're talking about taxpayers' money here. That's why we would conduct that review. And as I said, we're deeply concerned that we've not seen that kind of root and branch analysis from government over the last 14 years. And as a result, I think we're seeing now the impact, sadly, on our capability. You know, the first responsibility of any government is actually to protect our country and to keep it... OK, safe. so you say you'd spend the money that the, the armed forces need, but where would money come from in an instance like that? I mean, Labour has this problem that uh, the Tory party pinched two of their ideas in the budget. They're going to spend the money that you wanted to raise as well. They're going to spend it on tax cuts. You were going to spend it on other elements of public service. So, so where's the money going to come from, from for defence and for those public service commitments? Uh, well, Labour will always set out exactly how we would pay for all of our commitments. We've seen the impact, of course, under the Conservatives, particularly under Liz Truss, of setting out unfunded commitments, in her case, unfunded tax cuts. And there's lots of people paying the price for that, still with higher mortgage payments today. So Labour will always set out that detail. But I have to say, in terms of the U-turns that you just mentioned, coming from the government this week on non-DOM taxation, if you think about the period of time that the Conservatives okay. wasted when they could have put in place that taxation on people who live here but don't pay tax here, that could have paid for 3.8 okay. million procedures in our NHS. I but think I it's an get... important point, because okay. they kept arguing against it. OK, fine. And they could have used that money for positive things for OK, so you've made that point, but I want to, to find out if there's any clarity here that you can share with the public, because the Institute for Fiscal Studies has said that 
the government and you are in a conspiracy of silence ab about the realities that face the next parliament, that there's going to be a huge hit on spending. They say that you're not being honest about that, but you're saying here you, you want to give the armed forces the money they have, the money that they need, but people will ask, where will that money come from? Well, that's why Labour will always set out exactly how we will pay for our commitments, and we would be taking different choices to the Conservatives. Now, obviously, as we just talked about, they took a very long time, unfortunately, to say they would change that non-DOM tax regime. But also, Labour said, for example, that private schools shouldn't benefit from not being charged VAT and business rates when the schools that 90% of kids attend don't have the resources that they need. We've been really clear and upfront about that choice, also about the choice to be closing loopholes in private equity taxation so that we can adequately, adequately fund our mental health services and so on and so forth. So we would be taking different choices to the government and we will set out exactly how we will pay for our commitments in the run-up to the general election. Again, a big contrast with how the Conservatives have operated recently. OK, Annalise Dodds, uh, we appreciate your time. Thanks very much indeed for joining us. Pleasure. Um, and as I say, I will be picking up uh, some of those issues about the Public Accounts Committee and their report on funding for the armed services uh, with Meg Hillier, who's the chair of that committee, um, in a few minutes' time here on Sky News. But um, it's going to be one of those issues that... Um, Labour and the government will be questioned on this issue of funding for departments like the Ministry of Defence as well as other departments. Where exactly is the money going to come from? Um, so let's talk about this a little bit more. We've got uh, Rob Powell back here with me in the studio. We've also got Trevor Phillips joining us as well. Hey, Anna. Hey, hey, good to see you. And um, I guess, well, Trevor, I'm going to start with, with you because I guess there is going to be... Uh, a lot of the fallout from the budget to talk about this weekend when you got your show on on Sunday. Um, you know, yeah. some of the questions that have been left unanswered as a result of the budget are, are no doubt going to come up. Undoubtedly, I mean, um, I think that it'll have been picked over pretty uh, carefully. But I, I have to say that actually my theme for Sunday is going to be the crime wave that's sweeping across Westminster. Uh, we've now seen. There's a chap, I think he's called Hunt, that's a suspect, and he's nicked two big policies <laughs> from Labour, uh, abolishing non-dom status and the windfall tax. Uh, we expect to see the principal victim, Rachel Reeves, on the show on Sunday morning, mm -hmm. and uh, she obviously is going to be um, really deeply disturbed because she now has no money. Uh, so she's, we're going to talk... To her about how she's going to meet her promises, childcare, this, that, and the other. So that's crime on Sunday is our big thing. It's, it's funny, isn't it? Usually, when you have a Labour spokesperson on, as you just did with Annalise Dodds, the first thing that comes out of their mouth when you're sort of asking them about how they're going to raise money and how they're different is the non-dom scrapping the non-dom. <laughs> it was sort of conspicuous by its absence in Annalise Dodds' answer there, focusing on private equity and private schools because. Maybe that's sort of all they've got left in terms of differentiating themselves on tax and spend anyway. And it's going to be really tricky because today, for example, it's the issue of defence and there being shortfalls apparently in, in the Ministry of Defence's budgets. And they're going to be asked time and time again, will you make up those shortfalls and how will you spend them? How will you pay for them? Yeah, and the IFS were pretty clear yesterday that it was sort of a plague on both your houses. They said both Labour and the Tories were complicit in this conspiracy of silence because, of course, at the moment, um, Labour seem, they haven't confirmed it, but they seem set to maybe sign up to the broad tax and spend plans and the overall spending pledges that the Tories have laid out, which means they have as difficult questions when it comes to spending as the government. Well, you, you, you've just added a third crime to my list here, <laughs> which is the conspiracy of silence that the uh, IFS boss, Paul Johnson, talked to talked about yesterday. I, I think the truth is, is actually, there is a problem, and it's a problem for us, actually, that uh, the major parties seem to me to not be able to say to the public this one simple fact that actually everybody knows. There is no money. Uh, and we, to talk to them, what we're going to try and do is talk to them about whether we can be honest and what you do about that. Uh, it's worth saying, by the way, that there, there are some rather more serious crimes going about the place. We'll be, we'll be talking to uh, the wife of Vladimir Karamorza, who Mr Putin has... Uh, locked up um, and of course the likelihood is that that will what has happened to most of Mr Putin's enemies may happen to uh, Mr Karamurza as well uh, so it's going to be packed show on Sunday. 
It is going to be a packed show. We'll look forward to it, uh, Trevor, as, as we always do. And uh, uh, in the meantime, we'll, we'll talk about lots of those issues that you've just been discussing. Um, thanks very much indeed. Uh, do stay with us. We've got lots coming up on today's show as well, including we'll have more on that warning that the government lacks a credible plan to fund the armed forces. The chair of the Public Accounts Committee, Dame Meg Hillier. And we've got the sport for you as well, and there's a close call for Lewis Hamilton in practice for the Saudi Arabian Grand Prix. Welcome back. Uh, just to let you know that in a moment we're going to be talking to the chair of the Public Accounts Committee about that report about the funding of our armed services. So that'll be interesting. It's quicker about that. It will indeed. And uh, thanks very much indeed. Our top stories though this morning. Joe Biden has confirmed plans to build a temporary port to increase deliveries of humanitarian Minister aid to the people of Gaza. Jazzy. In his State of the Nine Union address Jazzy. overnight, the US president also urged Point Congress to continue supporting Jazzy. Ukraine in its war against Jazzy. Russia. And he said, history is watching. The former Prime Minister, Theresa May, has announced that she will stand down as an MP at the next general election. In a statement to her local paper, Mrs May said she wanted to focus on causes close to her heart, including her work on tackling modern slavery and human trafficking. The family of a seven-year-old girl who died trying to cross the channel say the boat they were travelling on was unfit for purpose and that people smugglers have no morals. Rua was one of 16 passengers on board the vessel that capsized in northern France last weekend. 
Now, MPs are warning that the government has no credible plan to fund the armed forces and that the UK has become increasingly reliant on its allies. The Public Accounts Committee has accused the Ministry of Defence of putting off painful decisions about where to make cuts, an attitude it warns leaves the UK in an alarming place. Well, let's get more on this. We can speak now to the group's chair, Dame Meg Hillier. Very good morning to you. Thanks so much for coming in. Uh, so tell us a little bit more about the concerns that your committee is raising today. Well, we look every year at the 10-year equipment plan. So that's the plan for what we need and how much it will cost over the next 10 years. And this year, very alarmingly, there's a nearly £17 billion gap at least in what we need and what we can afford. And we are really concerned because there needs to be very hard decisions about what's affordable and how that will, you know, perhaps not delivering on some capabilities. And one of the biggest increases, apart from inflation and foreign exchange, which are a contributor, is that we've seen a big increase in the nuclear enterprise. So to deliver that, which is essential, there will have to be hard decisions made in other parts of the armed forces. So, because the government says that it is putting money into the Ministry of Defence, and what you're saying is it's not going far enough, and a lot of it is taken up with that nuclear project. Yeah, look, we've seen over a number of years, we've been looking at this for over a decade now on the committee, um, that money goes in to the defence budget, and it just gets eaten up um, and no more capability is being provided but there's always a gap this is a particularly alarming sized gap um, and it is really critical especially when you look at what's going on with the war in Ukraine that has shown a real challenge to our supply chains and to the, the speed at which certain equipment is used if we were in a conflict um, so already that's testing it as you said at the beginning we rely on a lot on our allies for um, ensuring that we can actually protect ourselves and our and our alliances isn't relying on our is the point of things like NATO though and especially when Britain still pays in more than 2% of GDP and many NATO members still don't do that. Absolutely it's vital that we have that partnership but we've also got to contribute to that partnership mm. and we're being stretched very thin and one of the things the Ministry of Defence is really doing is assuming that it will get the two and a half percent of GDP spent on defence but at the moment it's only 2.1 percent so it's sort of wishful thinking and it's putting off the difficult decisions till the next spending review. That's the three-year review of how departments will spend money by government. That is scheduled for November of this year, but it's election year, you know, so the likelihood of that actually happening in November is very slim. So it's really, it's, it's, it's really running rather on empty at the moment because it's making assumptions, but those hard decisions are quite some time off. Possibly, you know, we're only in March now, possibly a year away before hard decisions are made. And in the meantime, money is still being spent. But let's come at it from the other point of view then. You talked about foreign exchange being an issue because of where arms are manufactured. Is enough being manufactured here and are arms companies doing enough to perhaps cut a deal with the MOD? Well, we're, we, I mean, obviously because of, uh, because of our allies, partly, we do do things in different countries, like they will buy equipment from us. But we are concerned about the supply chain, about that regularity of supply. If we want to retain good capability, highly skilled jobs here in the UK, then actually having a pipeline of production for our defence industries is really important. And if you have a gap in that, that's not good for our defence capability, but it's also not good for industry. Are we being too ambitious with what we're trying to do, given the constraints on the government purse? Well, there's got to be tough decisions made. We're in a very tough spending situation. And we've been saying repeatedly as a committee, you can't afford to do everything you say you're going to do. So you have to make decisions about whether you're going to keep that capability up or put more money in. But every time more money goes in, it just gets swallowed up. We don't actually, we still end up with a gap between what we can afford and what we want to achieve. And where does that leave us? What are the risks associated with a shortfall like this? Are we vulnerable as a nation, especially given some of the the global risks. We, yes, we're certainly squeezing parts of the system very tight. We've had uh, aircraft carriers on a major NATO exercise, and when one was out of commission, the second one had a problem. So we really have very little spare capacity. Um, so it's got to be tough decisions, have got to be made by whoever is in government after the election. You have to wonder what this does for the morale of people putting their lives on the line for us when the time comes, when they know that equipment's being cut, they're going to have to make do with what they've got and there's no sign of any more money coming down the pipe. Yeah, I'm glad you raised that, because it's a real concern. More people are leaving the armed forces than are joining. Yeah. Um, people with good skills can be snapped up by other sectors. Um, and the, the, the deal that was offered to our armed forces, that they got certain perks, if you like, for mm -hmm. doing this really important work and protecting us all, have been diminished. So there's a lot of really difficult issues here facing whoever wins the next general election. Mm -hmm. OK, Dame Meghelia, um, we appreciate you coming in. Thanks very much indeed for telling us a little bit more about your report. Thank you. And just to let you know that if you scan the QR code that you can see on screen right now, you can listen to the latest episode of our new podcast, Electoral Dysfunction. And each week, Beth Rigby, Jess Phillips and Ruth Davison unravel the spin in politics.
And this week they're asking why our MPs aren't talking more about our cash-strapped councils. And you can listen to Electoral Dysfunction wherever you get your podcasts. James is back with all the day's sport, and I promise you we won't just talk about Liverpool <laughs> this hour. <laughs> There's so much other things to talk is about. There, Go on, then. Is there, though? <laughs> I'm not and, sure there Anthony is. Anthony Joshua's back in action tonight. OK, in boxing fair enough. Saudi Arabia fighting Francis Ngannou. Now, he was a UFC fighter. He is... He's huge, absolutely huge. And he really gave Tyson Fury some problems last time out, so that's why this fight's been made. And we're hoping, I say we as boxing fans and sports fans, we're hoping that if he wins and Tyson Fury beats Alexander Usyk in the unified championship fight, which is happening, I believe it, I think May, June, we hope they finally can fight each other maybe at the end of the year. So, very excited. Yeah, no, you, I'm convinced. I'm not a fight fan. I'll take your word for it, James. <laughs> you prefer Liverpool. <laughs> Liverpool, Liverpool, Liverpool. That's all we get from that. Well, we have got Liverpool to come in the sport. We'll cover their fantastic victory last night in the Europa League uh, knockout stages. They're a step closer to the quarterfinals. And we'll give you an update of the fifth test between India and England. This Sky News Sports Bulletin is brought to you by Vitality. Getting more people more active. Live life with vitality. Now, this signifies a corner, OK? I don't want this and I don't want that. I need the hand up here, OK? That is contested. It's school on a Sunday, but nobody's complaining because the lesson is the laws of the game and the classroom is Villa Park. The FA wants to find 1,000 new black, Asian and mixed heritage referees from different communities around the country. It's part of the reflective and representative campaign. We want to increase the pool of referees from these communities at a grassroots level with the hope that in the future that these individuals can then go through the referee and progression pathway and then eventually a uh, referee within the Women's Super League and in the Premier League. Historically, maybe the interest wasn't there, but actually we haven't probably done enough to ac actually showcase what refereeing is about. You're going to go there and blow, blow the whistle and give a direct free kick. A lot of challenges that people talked about, the themes were, you know, referee courses were too expensive. Um, and that's why we've employed a bursary scheme as part of this campaign. You two go going into grassroots football and going into it as a referee um, with all the other challenges that I have uh, the other added challenge will be um, the, the, the discrimination angle you need to blow the whistle and put your hand like this it's got to be like this on every single cone the achievements of Sam Allison Rebecca Welsh and Sunny Singil have highlighted the importance of role models and mentors within refereeing with new refs coming through having people to aspire to the organisation BAMREF was set up to increase levels of representation in refereeing and we're in attendance on the day. Straight arm out. Well, I've never seen this before. It's absolutely amazing to be part of a room full of young, black, Asian, mixed heritage, uh, young people ready to start their refereeing journey. Do you remember when you first stepped into a room ready to do a referee call? I was the only female and I was the only black and Asian uh, mixed heritage of that community. To see this happening right now, this is what we need. We need people to feel that they belong in refereeing. And we're going to stop, blow and give a penalty. Yeah, still got it there. What I'm really, really um, so pleased to, about today is the fact that we've got a huge, wide, wide range, young 16-year-olds all the way up to adults really 12 years ago it was literally I walked into the room and it was a room full of about 45 people and I was the only person of colour when you look at the makeup of the football clubs the players themselves they, there's a very wide diverse background but actually onto the field of play as the officials no there isn't over 200 people accessed the bursary scheme between September and January with more to be added across 13 courses over February Referee courses can cost up to £140, but were lowered to 40 this time round.
I want to broaden my knowledge in football and um, in future I wish to have a full-time career in football in some aspect, whether that's refereeing, coaching or whatever, but um, I just want to be involved in football because I love the game. What I like about refing is that you don't have to be a great player or anything, it's just about showing your leadership skills and also enjoying the game alongside the players. I'm enjoying how it's like teaching people in independence and things and I, I quite like how I'll be able to to choose like what matches I go to and work on my own time schedule. What would the dream be in refereeing for you? Champions League final. The Champions League is the dream, Sunday League is the start. It's time to stop the caution on new faces in refereeing. Chris Reedy, Sky Sports. Leo, Hattie, Steve, Lachlan, thanks for joining me in Sky Sports News for this chat around uh, LGBT History Month. All of you, really, why did you sort of set up and get involved in the LGBT cricket groups that you're here representing today? And it was during COVID, actually, that... This Sky News Sports Bulletin is brought to you by Vitality. Do stay with us still to come here on The Breakfast Show. We're going to be speaking to an author who's drawn on her own experience to write a new book about learning to cope with grief. That has happened within minutes and now it's coming from both sides and it's moving this way. Only about half a mile from the Turkish coast, and it's evident that the boat is seriously overcrowded. This is one of the most severe viruses in the world. I'm Alex Crawford, and I'm Sky's special correspondent based in Istanbul. It got us then. There's a lot of action going on. A lot of heat still. We aim to be the best and the most trusted place in the news. Clearly not had very much to eat at all. A lot of them extremely thin and very frail. Look at her arms. I can put my entire hand round. This is the cocktail of drugs which the doctors at this hospital have been giving their coronavirus patients. Made for people who want clarity in an uncertain world. Mother Nature is, can be vicious, absolutely savage. The world's largest falls now down to a trickle in places. I can't imagine how much plastic is lying at the bottom of this huge lake. Whoa! <laughs> Close and personal with your honor. This is what makes the job so fantastic. Now, learning to cope with grief is a process that's different for everyone and while there's no right or wrong way to handle our feelings when someone dies, there are things that we can do to help us manage day-to-day -day life. 
Well, someone who knows all too well what it's like to lose a loved one is author Claire McIntosh, who's written a new book about this very subject, and uh, pleased to say she joins me now. Very good morning to you. Thanks morning. so much for coming in. A lot of people watching will know you for, for crime fiction. Yes. But this latest book you've written is very different, so tell us why you wanted to write it. I lost my son 18 years ago. He died when he was five weeks old. As a, um, he, he contracted meningitis. Um, and as you can imagine, my grief in those early days was all-encompassing. And what happened over the years is that I... You, you don't get better from grief, but you learn to live in a different way. You learn to cope with it. Um, and I realised a few years ago that I had moved to a point where actually I was no longer just surviving but thriving and because I'm a writer what I wanted to do was was to write about that I wanted to open up the discussion about grief I think it's something that particularly in this country we're not particularly good at um, and uh, so I wrote my my book I promise it won't always hurt like this and how was that process for you? Obviously, you're doing it partly to, to share your knowledge, but mm. was it cathartic for you or was it traumatic to kind of relive that pain? Both, Anna. Um, I, you know, I, I've looked at grief in my fiction and I think I, I thought I was quite good at processing my emotions as I, as I wrote about it, but when you're writing using fictional characters, there's a sort of layer of protection. When you're writing a memoir, you owe it to your reader to be completely honest about your feelings, and that means all the ugly bits of grief. You know, grief isn't just crying into a starched handkerchief. It's it's the anger and the bitterness and the, the envy of other people's happiness. It's a, a really complex, long-lasting condition. And is your experience that people experience it very differently? Or do you think there are kind of key themes, like you say, anger or, you know, periods of intense mourning? Or would, would you say there are common themes in the way that different people experience grief? Loss is universal, but grief is really unique to each person and, and unique to, to your individual grief. I, I lost my father shortly after my son died and the way that I grieved for my father was totally different. I thought I knew grief, but actually it hit me in a completely different way. There are commonalities, though, from, you know, I've spoken to lots of people who have lost loved ones, and we all agree that there are elements of, of being very angry, um, certainly uh, insomnia, or perhaps the opposite, needing to sleep all the time. Um, so there are, there are sort of common threads, I think, among people who are grieving. So what would you want people to take away from the book? The, the promise that it won't always hurt like this, that however... Mm -hmm dark the days feel in the early trenches of grief that there are better times ahead. Well, Claire McIntosh, thank you very much indeed for telling us a little bit about it. And um, I know it's probably not an easy subject to talk about, but so we, we're grateful for your time. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, we're going to bring in Wilfred Fro Frost now, who's uh, keeping an eye on all the events uh, this morning. Um, he's got his programme coming up a little bit later on. So, Wilf, what's taking your eye this morning? Well, we're going to be talking to the uh, former head of NATO, of course, after Sweden was confirmed uh, to, to have joined. We'll also be discussing uh, Theresa May's decision, of course, to step down as an MP ahead of the next session. We'll have a bit of a debate about uh, how what her legacy is, how good a prime minister... Uh, she was, and we'll also be breaking down the, the takeaways from the State of the Union, of course, last night. And we discussed already a little bit about uh, the, the way that uh, President Biden decided to start on the topic of Ukraine and uh, I, I think got a, a perhaps a slightly broader and warmer reception to those comments than we might have accept, uh, expected, given, of course, that the funding bill um, hasn't passed. I think the bottom line, though, of all of this, a 68-minute speech that largely he got through pretty well... Uh, and that's certainly not a, a negative, obviously. The debate will be how much of a positive it is on what is, of course, now uh, the head-to-head -head election campaign with uh, Nikki Haley pulling out, confirming, uh, all but confirming President Trump as his um, opponent. And this is probably the easiest of the big set-piece events he'll uh, have to tackle in, in the year ahead. It's fully scripted and there aren't journalists or fellow candidates in front of him uh, asking him questions. And, and the real test will be when the events come thick and fast on the campaign trail uh, and he has to think on his feet and to see if that undoes him. But, but last night, seemingly, uh, the responses have been it, it was not a loss, uh, perhaps a slight win for him.
OK, interesting stuff. Uh, so lots of analysis of that and Theresa May's legacy coming off a little bit later with you. Uh, well, thanks very much indeed. Um, we're going to check on the weather now. Warm memories wherever you go. To fly, to fly. The Weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Well, easterly winds will pick up today, gusting over the southwest, parts of Wales and to the lee of high ground. Uh, temperatures will be close to average for the time of year, but it'll feel considerably colder. There'll be a patchy frost to start the day, but there'll be sunshine for western Scotland and much of England and Wales. Early showers over Scotland should die away. Southern parts of the country will see temperatures reaching a high of 12 degrees Celsius, but values will remain in single figures for much of the country. The Weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Does anyone know what the lee of high ground means? I've said it a few In times. The in the shadow of. Thank you. Why didn't I ask you before? <laughs> GCSE geography. <laughs> serving You're me showing well, off finally, now. Finally serving See, me well. See, I didn't do it. In fact, didn't even have a GCSEs in my day. Anyway. Tell us about wow. Oxbow Lakes is next, Matt. Yeah. <laughs> Oxbow Lakes and a Roche Mutone, but that's one for the experts out there. <laughs> uh, anyway. We're going to talk about um, another story that's taken your interest, and it's not geography related. The Times caught my eye this morning for a couple of reasons. Some serious stories on there, but also a photo from Crow of uh, Anne Fisher kissing her dog, her poodle, Henry VIII. And I, I always get concerned with people kissing dogs on the mouth. Maybe that's, maybe that's just me. Uh, but really what Anna wants to talk about is a story beneath that. Doctors to track patients' step counts on the NHS app. You may not realise, if you have a smartphone like I do, an iPhone, it seems to automatically count your steps. It does. Steps. I check them regularly. Uh, do you? How, yeah. how well are you doing? Well, relatively poorly, but I compare my step count to my husband's on the same walk and he's always got m way more steps than me. <laughs> and we've concluded that he scuttles. You can That's see where decided. it goes as well, right? Because I remember when I looked at mine once, it was very depressing because it was just basically flat work, flat nursery, <laughs> flat work, flat nursery, over and over again. <laughs> That's life as a working dad. How many dad, have you done so far? Have you just I've checked? only done 500 steps today, which is abysmal. But this whole... Th what it raises is... Well, steps are good for you. Walking is obviously good for you, one of the best things you can do for your health. And the NHS is switching more to a preventative than a curing service because, well, ultimately it saves, saves money in the long run. But this idea of 10,000 steps be a day being the gold standard, it just came out... It was an arbitrary number True. that a Japanese... Scientists, I think, came up with. So, I mean, having said that, I do average over ten thousand. Oh, hey. <laughs> well done! I'm I'm peaking at one hundred and sixty-seven so far. Today. I've got my phone on me. Oh, never oh, mind. Oh, very convenient, Rob. <laughs> <laughs> we'll pick up with you in the next hour. Definitely, we're going to quiz you on that one. Uh, but we've got the top stories coming up for you next.
Hello, a very good morning. It's nine o'clock. Coming up on today's show, Joe Biden declares democracy is under attack at home and abroad in a flagship speech as he confirms plans to deliver aid to Gaza via the sea. Plus, the ballooning black hole in funding for the UK's armed forces. The Treasury tell us they don't recognise those claims. And in sport, India looks set to build a big first innings lead over England in the fifth test. It's Friday the 8th of March. President Biden says history is watching in his State of the Union address with attacks on Donald Trump, Vladimir Putin and a stark caution for Israel's leadership. Humanitarian assistance cannot be a secondary consideration or a bargaining chip. Protecting and saving innocent lives has to be a priority. It's a message that will be received with some concern here in Israel where there is still a huge dependence on the United States for security. After 27 years in Parliament and a challenging three in number 10, former Prime Minister Theresa May announces her intention to stand down. Sky News hears the anger of a family who paid thousands to people smugglers to reach Britain only for their daughter to drown in the Channel. She was seven years old. She'd seen nothing in this world. We wanted to make their lives better. MPs warned that the UK has no plan to properly fund the armed forces as the MOD's budget deficit balloons to a potential £29 billion. And Liverpool have one foot in the Europa League quarterfinals after thrashing Sparta Prague 5-1. Hello, very good morning. Thanks so much for joining us here on Breakfast. Our top story here this morning. In the year that we'll see him go head-to-head -head with Donald Trump once again, Joe Biden made his pitch to American voters overnight. Declaring that freedom and democracy were under attack, both at home and abroad, his State of the Union address was a broadside of both his predecessor and President Putin. There was also a caution to the United States chief ally Israel over the worsening humanitarian crisis in Gaza as he confirmed plans to deliver aid via the sea. Our US correspondent Mark Stone reports. President, how are you feeling, sir? Feeling good. It had been billed by his own side as a reset moment, a chance for the president to show a nation on prime time that the State of the Union is good under him. But even his journey there was to be complicated. Well, the president's due to drive down here, down Pennsylvania Avenue to Capitol Hill to make this all-important State of the Union address. It's been described as a make-or-break moment, and this is one of so many challenges that he faces. He avoided them, took another route to the hill, to the podium. No, it may not look like it, but I've been around a while. <laughs> when you get to be my age, certain things become clearer than ever. This is not traditionally the moment for partisan speeches, but he couldn't or wouldn't avoid it. Donald Trump on his mind, if not by name, throughout. Now my predecessor. My predecessor, my predecessor, my predecessor, my predecessor came to office determined to see Roe v. Wade overturned. Abortion was a key issue. Many of you in this chamber and my predecessor are promising to pass a national ban on reproductive freedom. My God, what freedom else would you take away? <laughs> and then an eyeballing for the justices who had restricted national abortion rights two years ago. With all due respect, justices. Women are not without electoral or political power. You're about to realize just how much you were right about that. It was heckling from the right. I... As he chastised them for blocking his Gosh. immigration legislation, even though it was legislation they had wanted. On the economy, he tried to persuade the American people that things are good, even if they don't feel it yet. Overseas, it was Ukraine first, but his dig was for Trump. It wasn't long ago when a Republican president named Ronald Reagan thundered, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. <laughs> now my predecessor, a former Republican president, tells Putin, quote, do whatever the hell you want. That's a quote. 
But the Middle East, Gaza and Israel, that came at the end. Tonight, I'm directing the U.S. military to lead an emergency mission to establish a temporary pier in the Mediterranean on the coast of Gaza. To the leadership of Israel, I say this. Humanitarian assistance cannot be a secondary consideration or a bargaining chip. Was this a reset moment? Well, he was uncharacteristically fluent, energetic, but he failed to paint a picture of an America capable of healing or coming together. Such is the state of the union right now. Mark Stone, Sky News in Washington. Well, let's cross to our Middle East correspondent, Alistair Bunkle, who's in Jerusalem for us this morning. So, Alistair, how will Israel respond to what President Biden said overnight? Well, I mean, I think Israel's been coming under a lot of pressure publicly and privately from the United States for quite a number of weeks now. So I don't particularly think that anything he said overnight ratchets it up uh, many notches, to be honest. They know that... Uh, there is some pretty profound disagreement between the two leaders, Benjamin Netanyahu and Joe Biden. They know pretty clearly what the Americans think about what is happening in Gaza, and they know what the Americans want them to do about it. The news, though, that American, American military is going to look to build a port of some description, perhaps a port's the wrong word, maybe a sort of some sort of floating pier, uh, whatever it might be, to get aid into Gaza. Well, I mean, officially, the Israelis have, have welcomed that, but they'll, they'll know that it is a way that the Americans are trying to circumvent uh, land routes uh, into Gaza, which, despite requesting that more land routes are opened by the Israelis, that has not yet happened. And so I think from an American point of view, Whilst some will say this shows leadership by the White House, others will say that it shows a failure of US leadership. What it essentially shows is that America is having to think of different ways to get aid into Gaza now because the crisis is deteriorating pretty rapidly. They're trying airdrops. They're now looking at maritime routes. Uh, it is a very imperfect situation uh, and it is a very urgent situation. OK, Alistair, thanks very much indeed. Thank you. Well, the other piece of news uh, that came in this morning was that Theresa May is going to stand down at the next election. The latest MP saying that they're not going to stand again post the general election or for the general election. The latest and uh, the latest prime minister to go off and decide, yeah. ex-prime minister to go off and decide to do something different. She has announced this in her local paper, which made me think this is in quite the contrast to what Liz Truss has been doing in her role as ex-prime minister recently. Quite different styles between the two of them. But, yes, as Anna said there, the former Prime Minister, Theresa May, has announced that she will stand down as an MP at the next general election, whenever that may be. In a statement to that local paper, the May's an advertiser, Mrs May said she wanted to focus on causes that are close to her heart, including her work on tackling modern slavery and human trafficking. Next, last weekend, a seven-year-old girl became the latest victim of the perilous journey, attempting to cross the Channel. The boat that she and her family were travelling in capsized, trying to leave northern France. Rua was one of 16 passengers on the vessel, and despite their personal tragedy, the family say they're still planning to attempt to cross the Channel again. They've been talking to our Europe correspondent, Adam Parsons. Rua was seven years old. Her life spent moving through Europe on a long journey towards the UK, a journey that ended with her death. She was beautiful. I lost her from my hands, my little princess. She was seven years old. She'd seen nothing in this world. We wanted to make their lives better. <laughs> Rua's family had paid a people smuggler to take them to Britain, but the boat capsized and Rua drowned. Those people are criminals. They do not see humans as humans. They only see money. They treat humans like objects. They have no morals, ethics or humanity. <laughs> Bewildered in grief, Rua's three brothers. She was very dear to us, but she's gone now, and I want her to come back, but she won't. 
This wasn't a normal channel crossing attempt. The family had boarded a small stolen riverboat 12 miles inland from the French coastline. <laughs> Collecting her body from a morgue, Rua's family dreading the farewell to come. As they left, Rua's small wooden coffin followed behind. There was little time to linger. Muslim tradition dictates burials must take place before sunset. We often talk about the dangers of cross-channel migration, that this is what it looks and feels like when things go terribly wrong. A bereaved, devastated family, a local community trying to offer solace, and at the heart of it, the grave of a seven-year-old girl. Her family say they are hollow with grief, but that they still plan on getting to Britain. And that will mean another smuggler and another dangerous boat. Adam joins us now from Brussels. Adam, incredibly moving images there. It's a very sad story about Rua, but people watching may be surprised, maybe even shocked to hear that her family are considering trying to cross the channel again on a boat. I think they would be shocked. Uh, I was shocked when they said that to me. Uh, I mean, this is a family who left Iraq uh, about six years ago and have been crossing Europe, trying to find uh, a, a place to live and have frankly failed and had set their hearts on coming to Britain, <laughs> said that they talked about the Queen as being somebody who is a friend to migrants, said that they thought the King now would be somebody who would help migrants, that they saw the UK as a sort of beacon of hope. And I think that if there is one thing, in a sense, that the political debate can take from this, it is that this idea of dissuading people from making this channel crossing is a very hard one to make stick. I cannot, frankly, think of anything worse than losing your child in these circumstances, trying to get across the channel. And yet, in this case, and these are intelligent, eloquent, thoughtful people. Even that has not been enough to dissuade them from that ambition, that, that devastation of being in a boat that capsizes and knowing that your, your seven-year-old daughter has drowned. So I think it is an important testimony of the determination of people to continue to make this perilous crossing it's an expression we use a lot, and in a sense, it, it's a binary outcome. Most people who try to cross the channel on one of these unsuitable, frankly, sort of unsafe boats actually make it to the other side. Most of these crossings don't result in, in death or, or, or serious injury. But, of course, every now and then, they do. And when that happens, it is devastating. We don't normally... I think, get to see behind the statistics of this. Very often when we talk about deaths in the channel, it's simply a number. What we saw here was the reality, and frankly, it was pretty grim. Certainly, Adam. Thank you very much indeed. Next, the family of a former American footballer who shot dead six people before taking his own life say they're going to sue the NFL. Philip Adams' family claim his death was caused by head injuries he suffered during his sporting career. Our US correspondent Martha Kellner has more. Philip Adams had a very successful NFL career. He played for numerous teams between 2010 and 2016, uh, the likes of the San Francisco 49ers, the New England Patriots. But five years after he retired, he committed the most horrific crime. He shot dead six people at a house in South Carolina, including a prominent local doctor, Robert Leslie, his wife, Barbara, their two grandchildren aged just five and nine years old and two gentlemen who were working on the house at the time. After a standoff with police, he then turned the gun on himself, took his own life. And his family at the time said that they believed what he did that day was linked to his football career. They sent his brain off to be analysed and it returned findings of a severe case of CTE. Now, CTE is a brain disease. It's linked to a history of traumatic head injuries and they're now suing, I understand, they're suing the NFL in a wrongful death lawsuit. It's a highly significant 
legal move. It's also one that could be very costly for the NFL. And it takes place against this backdrop of growing calls for more investigation into potential links between head injuries in contact sports and violent crime. It's something I've been investigating. And just this week, there was uh, the findings came back on the brain of Robert Card, the, the man who shot dead 18 people uh, in the state of Maine last October. It showed that he didn't have CT, but he did have a history uh, of traumatic brain injuries. Now, uh, with regards to Philip Adams' case, I have contacted the NFL for comment. They've not yet responded. Martha Kellner there for us in the US. Now, 287 students have been kidnapped by gunmen in northwest Nigeria. Local people have said the abductors surrounded a school as pupils were about to start the day there. It is the second mass abduction in the country in less than a week. London streets have become a no-go zone for Jews during pro-Palestinian protests. A government advisor is warning. Writing in the Daily Telegraph, counter-extremism commissioner Robin Simcox said the government must be prepared to be bolder when dealing with the issue, even if it means a higher legal risk. It follows the Prime Minister Rishi Sunak's speech last week where he claimed extremists were trying to tear the country apart. Now, a group of MPs have warned that the Ministry of Defence has no credible plan for funding the future of Britain's armed forces and that the UK has become increasingly reliant on its allies. Speaking to this programme in the last hour, the Treasury Minister, Gareth Davis, said he doesn't recognise those claims by the Public Accounts Committee. Got record funding going into defence. It was uplifted 11 billion uh, last year. And we have a spending review that will take place uh, next year where uh, you know, defence spending will be reviewed again. Uh, but I, I don't accept that. I think there is a significant amount of funding going into defence. I think one of the only countries uh, to be uh, meeting our uh, NATO uh, target of 2%. We're the only political party, by the way, that has an ambition to get to 2.5% of GDP on defence spending when it's responsible to do so. But as I say, there is billions of pounds going into our defence budget, not least with an uplift last year of 11 billion into it. So when will you help hit that target of 2.5% of GDP? Well, it's, it's a long-term ambition that we want to make sure that we can do so responsibly and in a sustained way but as I say, we are the only ones uh, that have committed to doing that. Well, let's bring in our security and defence editor, Deborah Haynes. So the, the Treasury Minister there hitting back at this Public Accounts Committee report, saying he doesn't recognise the figures. Well, the, the MOD's own figures, so um, he probably does recognise them, but there is always this fric friction between the Treasury and the Ministry of Defence over the budget. Uh, it is true that the Defence Ministry does have a big budget, more than £50 billion, pounds, um, and there is real frustration about the way it's spent. I mean, in this Public Accounts Committee report, I mean, yes, they do say there's this massive funding gap, so clearly the pressure is to try to fill that, but they also look at, at how the Ministry of Defence actually procures equipment and its very poor record of cost overruns and delays. In fact, out of 46 major programmes, so the most important equipment programmes, only two are deemed to be um, achievable within the right time, with the right quality um, and within budget. And five of these programmes are actually deemed to be unachievable. And that includes pretty important stuff like the nuclear reactor, missiles and communications gear. So there is a friction there. But fundamentally, when you've got a world that's increasingly dangerous, when you've got a prime minister who likes to talk tough about Britain's role in the world and the need to help um, support allies in Ukraine, um, hitting out against the Houthis in Yemen. Then when you actually look at the, the funding that's backing that up in terms of the ambition of the size of the force that you want and see a massive gaping hole of many multiples of billions of pounds, then there is a real credibility issue here. And now it's not the time for smoke and mirrors. OK, Deborah, thanks very much indeed. Thanks. Do stay with us. We've got lots coming up for you in just a moment, including why women working in the city are still being subjected to sexual harassment at work.
women seeing um, celebrities who they can recognise, they can identify with, talking about something that they are going through and may not have realised. I think it's really helped to bring the conversation to the fore. That said, I know what you're talking about, that there's been this... Um, dramatization and that it's yes. it's catastrophizing and I feel that there's got to be a balance somewhere there's a lot of focus on all of the very extreme stuff that happens and I think we need to be talking about the education the positive things that women can do themselves before we go to every woman is going to have a terrible menopause and I don't think that does women any favors because people start to say oh, menopausal woman oh you know they're all in a box, they're all going through the same experience. I think there are, there are an awful lot of other papers and a lot of other research that says that the psychological impact of, of menopause can be, can be greater than um, women realise. And actually it's one of, often one of the first signs, anxiety um, and sort of low mood. Is it internal, is it external factors? We're living in a very complicated world. People, of course there are stresses, but there are stresses at 30, there are stresses at 20. Is it a big coincidence that as your hormones are readjusting in your 40s, early 50s, that suddenly these, yes, you're dealing with it, um, probably elderly parents, work, but you've got that problem at other times of your life. So I think m everything is being minimalised in that report to say it, it's not your hormones. What we need to be talking about is it can actually be a time to reframe your life and actually get, if you've been a little bit off track, get back on track, looking after yourself with your diet, your exercise, your movement. There's so much evidence-backed information about women need to be moving more. It's going to help with their physical health, their mental health. So I see it as a gate opening rather than a gate closing. And I think that's the misconception with menopause. Now, women working in the city are regularly subjected to bullying and even sexual harassment. That's the findings of a new report by the Treasury Committee, which says the government must do more to help tackle sexism in the workplace once and for all. Well, Harriet Baldwin is chair of the Treasury Committee and joins me now. So tell us a little bit more, Harriet Baldwin, about what your committee has found. Well, thank you, Anna, and thank you to all the women who were brave enough to come forward and give us evidence. So uh, we heard from a wide range of women who've worked in this sector. We're looking at just the period since 2018, so really just a very recent period. And we want to see how much has changed since our committee last looked at this issue. And I'm afraid uh, the short answer is not much. And one of the things that we think is a challenge is this use of non-disclosure agreements to manage out um, the victims of sexual harassment while retaining the predators in organisations. We think this is the jewel in the crown of the UK economy, this sector. It's a fantastic sector. It uh, is very well paid and it also generates lots of jobs around the country. So let's make sure that we can try and get things right in the workplace so that this sector can continue to grow and thrive and pay lots of the taxes that fund our public services. Why do you think it's so bad and that it's improving at such a slow pace? I think that, the, you know, you will probably find that this existed in other parts of the UK economy. But I think in the financial services sector, what stands out is because it's such a well-paid sector, you've got a really wide pay gap in these organisations. And also, um, because it's such a high paid sector, I think you sometimes get some real disparities in terms of power relationships, power dynamics. 
And so, you know, if it's your boss that's doing this to you, or if it's, um, you know, a, um, a very important uh, relationship in terms of a customer, you know, it can be a really difficult thing to whistleblow about. One of the things that we're trying to publicise and flag in this report is the fact that the Financial Conduct Authority does have a whistleblower hotline where you can report these kinds of things. And also, really importantly, even if you've signed a non-disclosure agreement, you can still use that whistleblower hotline. Well, yeah, so there's the, the, drawing attention to that hotline and uh, encouraging people to come forward. But what else are you suggesting could be done that might try and change the landscape a bit? Well, what we're saying is that, you know, this is hugely in the interests of businesses to get right. And the businesses that get this right are... Um, all the evidence suggests there have been lots and lots of studies that they become more successful, more profitable, they retain their talent better. And so we've suggested a range of different things. For example, you know, when you go for that job interview, wouldn't it be helpful if you knew what the range of pay would be in that particular role? Wouldn't it be helpful if you knew what the policies were for that firm uh, when it comes to maternity and paternity leave, rather than feeling that you have to ask that slightly awkward question during the interview. And so we're calling for more transparency around things like that. We're calling for management and boards to really take responsibility for this. We don't think this should be down to the regulators to impose a solution. We think well-run firms ought to be measuring their progress on these things, because what gets measured gets done. And presumably, um, is there an issue of having too many men at the top of a company filters its way down? Would you be in favour of, of quotas on the board, for example? Is that something that works? Well, interestingly, there are a range of initiatives that are more voluntary, that are not so much quota-led. There's something called the Women in Finance Charter, which now has been signed by 400 major companies that covers a million employees. And that does uh, call for uh, measuring and uh, measuring that progress in terms of the number of people in the senior uh, rungs of management. It's also really important, of course, to focus on making sure you're recruiting in a balanced way and also that you're keeping people in your firm. And I think this is something that good firms do well. It gives them a real competitive advantage. And it's really, I think, something that all management should take seriously and try to measure seriously rather than, you know, just trying to fulfil a tick box exercise um, in terms of uh, what the regulator is demanding. Well, a really, really interesting subject. On International Women's Day, uh, no coincidence, I'm sure, that you brought out your report no. today. Um, <laughs> uh, Harriet Baldwin, thanks very much indeed. Thanks for your time. Thanks for having me, Anna. Now then, there's been a little bit of confusion about where the Conservatives stand on axing national insurance. Several government ministers have told Sky News very slightly different things. Now, here's what the Treasury Minister, Gareth Davis, told this programme this morning. We want to get national insurance uh, contributions down to the extent that we remove the unfairness over time. So the long-term ambition, the long-term ambition, it may take several parliaments, but the long-term ambition is to remove that unfairness, absolutely. And if you just look at our actions in the last six months, we've already reduced it by some, uh, I think, 30%. A third of it has gone down as a result of Jeremy Hunt's last two fiscal events. Well, Rob is back with us. And so national insurance came down in this budget. Jeremy Hunt had already lowered it in the previous autumn statement as well. Are we clear now about what happens next? Uh, sort of. I, I think... It, the lack of clarity comes from whether this is a cast iron pledge that Conservatives will eventually get rid of national insurance or whether this is a sort of broad direction of travel aspiration. I'm not sure we're necessarily any clearer on that. What, what sources in the Treasury are saying behind the scenes this morning is they've always been clear that they've said, look, this was a long term aim. So it might be achieved over one parliament, it might be achieved over several parliaments. They weren't putting a definite timeline on it. The difficulty is, is that I think in, in tone, if not in content, we've been getting slightly different messages when ministers have been turning up here and doing interviews. We had one Treasury minister after the budget saying, yes, the plan is to eliminate it completely. Then we had the Work and Pension Secretary yesterday saying he had a different understanding and it was about cutting national insurance and bringing it down. Um, and now you have a sort of semi-timeline put on it by another Treasury Minister saying it could take several parliaments. So 
I think what they will be aware of is the Labour attack, that yeah. this could be an unfunded tax cut. They're, they're putting a figure of £46 billion on it or something, yeah. if it was to just suddenly be axed. And this morning, what Labour sources are saying are that the government should be clear about how much they want to bring national insurance down in the next parliament. This is all part of the battle lines for the next election around spending and around being sensible with the public finances. The Tories have tried to attack Labour on it. This is Labour sensing an opportunity to potentially do the same to their opposite number. And we're going to get lots more of that before the next election. Yeah, look yeah. forward to it. OK, Rob, thank you. Uh, let's check on the weather now. Warm memories wherever you go. To fly, to fly, the weather, to sponsored by Qatar Airways. Well, easterly winds will pick up today, gusting over the southwest, parts of Wales, and to the lee of high ground. Temperatures will be close to average for the time of year, but it will feel considerably colder. There'll be a patchy frost to start the day, but there'll be some sunshine for Western Scotland and much of England and Wales. Early showers over Scotland should die away. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. James is back with us for, and you've got all sorts this morning, haven't you? Cricket, <laughs> tennis, bit Formula of rugby, One, Formula One, boxing. football, boxing. Is that it? Is that it? Tiddlywinks. <laughs> Tiddlywinks is coming <laughs> later on. Um, yeah, you're good at that, apparently. Tiddlywinks. That's what I've heard. It's your sport. I don't, right? know, I don't know where you've heard that. I've, I was just throwing an off-the-cuff remark. It wasn't a comment on my sporting prowess. No, that's what we have Oh, come told, on. Yeah. OK, yeah, I'm, I'm sure you're very pretty. good. When I play Tiddlywinks, I take no prisoners. Yeah, I'm that's pretty it. good. There we go, there we go. Anyway, but the big game Sunday, Liverpool-Manchester City. Huge. <sighs> Huge game. A Dar I, I, Darwin Nunez back on scoring form. He was on scoring form last night. I feel like, though, the next couple of days, all the build-up's going to be towards that game because the Premier League's exciting this year. Yeah. You know, best, really is. The the best league in the world. <laughs> best league in the world. Liverpool, Manchester City, Arsenal, who's your money on? Definitely not the last lot. Liverpool, obviously. I mean, come on. Yeah, Liverpool Fox, fans in our house. We're very biased Liverpool. answers you're getting here. I think they're both going to be wrong. <laughs> All right, so uh, we'll bring you the latest from the fifth and final test between India and England and a welcome win for Emma Raducanu at the Indian Wells Tennis. Uh, plus, we've got goals from a mixed night for the British sides. Pretty good for Liverpool, uh, not for others, but that was in the European knockout stages. And there's a close call for Lewis Hamilton in practice for the Saudi Arabian Grand Prix. And Anthony Joshua promises to deliver victory in tonight's heavyweight showdown with Francis Ngannou.
all the sport coming up for you in a moment. No tiddlywings, though, um, sadly. But lots of other news around this morning, sports-wise and news-wise, of course. Yes, it is a, a busy day, obviously, uh, after the back of um, State of the Union address from President Biden. We'll hear more about that uh, right now, because uh, it is our top story today. Joe Biden's confirmed plans to build a temporary port, in fact, to increase deliveries of humanitarian aid to the people of Gaza. In his State of the well, Union address, the US president also urged Congress to continue supporting murder. Ukraine in its war against Russia and said that history is watching. Duvalde, Texas. The family of a seven-year-old girl who died trying to cross the channel say the migrant boat they were on was unfit for purpose and that people smugglers have no morals. Ruar was one of 16 passengers on a makeshift vessel that capsized in northern France last weekend. MPs are warning that the government has no credible plan to fund the armed forces and that the UK has become increasingly reliant on its allies. The Public Accounts Committee has accused the Ministry of Defence of putting off painful decisions about where to make cuts. And the former Prime Minister, Theresa May, has announced she will step down as an MP at the next general election. In a statement to her local newspaper, Mrs May said she wanted to focus on causes close to her heart, including her work on tackling modern slavery and human trafficking. So James is here with the sport, um, and as we say, it's a it's a busy old day. It's a busy day. It's a busy day for a Friday because there's boxing on tonight as well. There's Formula One qualifying for the Saudi Arabian Grand Prix, and you usually expect that to be on a Saturday. So it kind of extends the weekend for all sports fans out there. It makes it a bit of a bumper weekend, really. But Anthony Joshua in action tonight. I'm looking forward. Your to weekend it. sorted. My weekend sorted. Yeah. <laughs> My poor other half. Well, well, yeah. The TV's been. Uh, been, it's all yours. Yeah, it's been reserved for a while this weekend. We've got a <laughs> calendar at home and I have to put certain things <laughs> really? into it. Yeah, it's wow. ridiculous, but you know, needs must. You don't want any drama. You want to make sure that you're doing everything in advance. Have you got a little fort be. built around a the sofa and yeah. excellent. Surprising Good. details. Yeah. <laughs> That's, I'm, not, I'm an honest guy. All right, so last night's uh, European football shortly, but let's start with the latest from the fifth and final test between India and England. In the first innings, lead is approaching 200 in Dharamsala. Now, India began day 235 for one, trailing by 83, but they breezed past England's first innings total without losing a wicket. Captain Rohit Sharma here and Shubman Gill both get in their centuries. After lunch, so Ben Stokes got fellow captain Rohit for 103 in his first spell of competitive bowling in 251 days. Shubman Gill followed to James Anderson for 110, India 403 for five, a lead of 185. Liverpool have one foot in the Europa League quarter-finals. They thrash Sparta Prague in the first leg of their round of 16 tie. Liverpool won 5-1 in Prague. Darwin Nunes scored twice in the first half. Both goals pretty special. Liverpool take a commanding lead back to Anfield next Thursday. And next up for them is this weekend's huge Premier League clash with Manchester City. Brighton's European dream looks to be fading fast. They were beaten 4-0 by Roma in Italy in their first leg. Paolo Dybala and this goal from Romelu Lukaku amongst the scores. There's work to do for West Ham next week. They lost their first leg 1-0 in Freiburg. West Ham had a very late VAR check for a penalty turned down in this one. Rangers got a two-all draw in their first leg against Benfica. Rangers took the lead twice in Lisbon. Tom Lawrence and Dion Sterling with their goals, all to play for at Ibrox next Thursday. In the second tier Europa Conference League, Aston Villa drew 0-0 in Amsterdam against Ajax. Both teams though, were reduced to 10 men in the closing stages. Defender Esri Konsa sent off for Villa and will miss next week's second leg at Villa Park. Chelsea booked their place in the Conti Cup final for a fifth season in a row. Lauren James got them a narrow 1-0 win at Manchester City. Chelsea now play Arsenal in the final at Molyneux at the end of the month. Aston Martin's Fernando Alonso set the pace in practice for the Saudi Arabian Grand Prix ahead of Mercedes' George Russell and Red Bull's Max Verstappen. 
Lewis Hamilton, though, had a session to forget. He was eighth fastest in his Mercedes and was given a warning by stewards after causing this near miss with Williams Logan Sargent during practice two. Final practice from 1.30 this afternoon with qualifying underway from five live on Sky Sports F1. Emma Raducanu enjoyed a comfortable first round win at the Indian Wells Tennis. The 21-year-old Brit in the pink here beat Spanish qualifier Rebecca Mazarova 6-2-6-3 to set up a second round meeting with Ukraine's Diana Yastremska. It's Raducanu's fourth win in seven matches since her return from an eight-month injury layoff. In a men's draw, Dan Evans is out. The British number two lost the match and his temper during a three-set defeat to Roman Safilon. This evening, Andy Murray is in second round action against fifth seed Andre Rublev, live on Sky Sports Tennis from 8.30. Britain's Anthony Joshua weighed in almost a stone and a half lighter than Francis Ngannou for tonight's heavyweight box office bout in Saudi Arabia. Two-time world champion Joshua weighed in at 18 stone but promised to deliver a victory over the former UFC fighter. The winner of the fight has been tipped to fight the winner of Tyson Fury's unification fight with Alexander Usyk. Joshua Ngannou is live tonight on Sky Sports box office. The latest from the fifth test between England and India, plus build up to a big weekend of boxing, Six Nations and Premier League action over on Sky Sports News, and we're back later. James, thanks very much indeed. Um, are we all going to stay up on Sunday night for the Oscars? Uh, no, I'm working on Monday, so I, and I'm, I'm working on Sky, so I might just report on it if that's okay with you. <laughs> we'll let you off. My, my TV time's maxed out this weekend with the sports, so uh, yeah. oh yeah, Oscars no, you is can't. no go. Oscars is no go. So well. Are you? President Biden overnight or Oscars on Sunday night? I'd love to, but mm. I probably won't, to be honest, because it is very late in the day. But I'll look forward to that early morning catch yes. up. Um, do the headline awards ceremony have an age gap problem? That's the uh, question we're asking now about the Oscars. Uh, from Los Angeles, our arts and entertainment correspondent Katie Spencer reports. A land of airbrushed perfection. Hollywood has always had an issue with ageing, reflected in who wins what here. At the Oscars, typically it's been the young female ingenue rewarded, while the men alongside them get to mature like fine wines. I can tell even if I can't see, and I heard the word fat, fat and, and ugly. No one but me would dare and I did not. The invisibility of middle-aged women on screen, not lost on 2019's winner. I don't stop watching telly once I'm 31 or films or stories or theatre, I still want to watch. Yeah. And, and although you don't pay us as much, <laughs> we still have some clout. So uh, don't estimate, underestimate women. But could the industry finally be turning a corner? Those still able to move an eyebrow might well want to raise one at Sky News' analysis of the Oscars acting categories this year. Take the average age of male winners over the decades and put them next to the women and note that crossover. Because of wins for older women at recent ceremonies, cemented last year with Michelle Yeoh and Jamie Lee Curtis winning, who are both in their 60s, it's meant the average age gap has closed for the first time. Technically taken this year alone and not the decade average, if winners go as predicted, there'll still be an acting age gap of 16 and a half years. But that's still way better than what was repeatedly going on in the 90s and noughties. Take the year 2000, for instance, when between Hilary Swank and Angelina Jolie, Kevin Spacey and Michael Caine, the average age gap was 29 years. Jodie Foster has experienced it all. A nominee aged 14, winning twice before she was 30. What you want to do has never been done. I mean, especially not for a woman. Now, over 30 years later, she's up for an Oscar again for a film about endurance swimmer Diana Nyad. The world of complexity hasn't always been reserved for women, you know? We were the mother of, the sister of, the prostitute of, you know? It, it, it has taken a lot of work by women to flesh out female characters in the industry over time. While it's too early to say for certain whether Hollywood's ironed out the wrinkles in its age gap problem, taking the overall picture by decade, for the first time, progress. Katie Spencer, Sky News. Let me just bring you a little bit of breaking news. And we've just had confirmation from the Foreign Secretary, David Cameron, that the UK will be helping the US get aid into Gaza via 
the sea. This is the announcement yesterday from the Americans that they were going to build a port in Gaza to try to get more humanitarian aid in. Um, David Cameron has posted on X in the last few minutes and he has said, people in Gaza are in desperate humanitarian need. Alongside the US, the UK and partners have announced that we will open a maritime corridor to deliver aid directly to Gaza. We continue to urge Israel to allow more trucks into Gaza as the fastest way to get aid to those who need it. Uh, so uh, the Foreign Secretary there confirming that the UK will have a role in that new port to get aid into Gaza. Uh, no doubt there will be more questions about what form that will take precisely in the hours ahead. In the meantime, still to come here on The Breakfast Show. The world will remember this day. I'll work here. Could this film be about to become one of the biggest winners ever? We'll take you through all the favourites for this weekend's Oscars coming up next. Until somebody builds it bigger. one of the most severe viruses in the world. I'm Alex Crawford and I'm Sky's special correspondent based in Istanbul. This is going to be the biggest party Tripoli has ever seen. That's it. it, it got us then. There's a lot of action going on, a lot of heat still. We aim to be the best and the most trusted place in the news. at all, a lot of them extremely thin and very frail. Look at her arms, I can put my entire hand round. This is the cocktail of drugs which the doctors at this hospital have been giving their coronavirus patients. Made for people who want clarity in an uncertain world. Mother Nature is, can be vicious, absolutely savage. I can't imagine how much plastic is lying at the bottom of this huge lake. Oh! <laughs> close and personal with the rhino. This is what makes the job so fantastic. Fly Emirates, fly better.
A bit more breaking news to bring you now. The Metropolitan Police firearms officer accused of murder over the fatal shooting of Chris Cabber can now be named as Martin Blake. That's following a hearing at the Old Bailey. Uh, we will bring you more on that. We'll be live to the Old Bailey a little bit later on. Uh, but for the moment, uh, that's the news just in, that the police firearms officer accused of the murder of Chris Cabber has now been named as Martin Blake. More on that a little bit later. In the meantime, though, let's go back to the Oscars because they're nearly upon us. They're on Sunday night. And uh, one of the big questions is, will Oppenheimer win big again? Entertainment journalist Lucy Jones is here for us. And um, Lucy, we say will Oppenheimer win big because it's done pretty well in the award ceremonies up, up to this point. And there was a time earlier in the year when everyone was just talking about Barbenheimer, weren't they? There were two films, but Oppenheimer seems to be pulling ahead here. Yeah, Barbenheimer, I think, is a bit, a bit of a thing of the past. It was fun, wasn't it? The, did you it wear pink to the cinema? Did <laughs> yeah. you go and did see... Did you watch them together yeah. on the same day? Yeah, I mean, it's 13 nominations, Oppenheimer. It's actually been compared to the likes of Titanic. It's absolutely massive. This is Christopher Nolan's moment. He's going to win it the best director. He's bound to win best picture. Um, one, obviously, movie. absolutely absolutely swept the board at the BAFTAs as well. The Seven wins there. The um, I think Barbie is a shame. It's a billion-dollar movie. It should really be, you know, celebrated in some way. I think it'll win Best Song with um, Billie Eilish and her brother Phineas. But and maybe perhaps costumes are going up against Poor Things, which is incredible um, visually. But, yeah, I think it's the, the year of Oppenheimer, not Barbie. There's a template, isn't there, for an Oscar-winning film? And you look at the... the well, it's, a, it's a longer list than it used to be. Yeah. It's not a short list anymore, quite a long list. But films like Maestro, like Oppenheimer, biopics, or historic, serious films like The Zone of Interest um, and uh, American fiction, not historic. Killers of the Flower Moon. Killers of a Flower Moon, exactly what it is the one I was looking for. I mean, I haven't seen any of them, as you know, because <laughs> they just find them too long these At least days. At least honest. I've got three hours on my hands, sadly. <laughs> Um, it's, it's quite telling that there are no popular films there. Really, Barbie's about the only one. Well, it's interesting because Christopher Nolan famously missed out on the Dark Knight nomination yeah. all those years ago, and he's been campaigning to get more films recognised in the Best Picture category, and I think they should be. As you said, Barbie, it was, a f it was fun, wasn't it? It was just a nice, light-hearted thing to go and see with your friends with a glass of rosé wearing pink, <laughs> and I'm glad it was nominated for Best Picture. It won't it win, works. but as you said, it is about the biopics, isn't it? But yeah, Maestro, you mentioned that, I don't yeah. think that's going to be winning yeah, anything, unfortunately, in regards to Bradley Cooper. He, I mean, it was his year this year, and then Killian Murphy comes out and puts in that stellar performance. So I think Bradley's desperate to win that best. Well, yeah, and I, I saw Maestro. I did think it was absolutely brilliant. But there are other really good films in there, aren't there, in that list? I mean, it, it feels like a really strong year this year. Is there, is there, have you got a sneaking regard for one of the films and thinks that, that it should pit... Oppenheimer to the post? I loved The Holdovers. It was so yeah. much fun. And Paul Giamatti is just incredible. He's not going to win that, though, because Killian's going to win it. So you think but... Killian Murphy for, for Best Actor? What about Best Actress, then? Well, this is the talking point. This is really interesting. So Emma Stone is going up against Lily Gladstone, basically. Emma Stone was Poor Things. Poor Things wouldn't be anything without Emma. She was the just the whole movie. And Lily Gladstone, it's just incredible in Killers of the Flower Moon. Three hour long movie, might I add. Too long. Three too hours, long. 26 <laughs> minutes, actually. Way too long. <laughs> he has yeah. a very short attention span. But I do <laughs> think this, the last, um, <laughs> the, last um, the last film ceremony we've seen, um, winners, was SAG. Now, Lily Gaston Screen won Actors that. Guild. Yes. Rather than any comment on any of the people attending. But just a little fact for you, only three times out of 13 has the SAG winner not won an Oscar. That's and so And Lily Gaston won the SAG, so okay. we'll see. Emma Stone won the BAFTA, then. There you go. Yeah, that, that's... Oh, it'll be fascinating stuff. Uh, Lucy, thanks very much indeed. And um, we should mention that you've been to the BAFTAs, haven't you? I've been to the BAFTAs. I've, the BAFTAs. I've, 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 been the Oscars. Oscars. <laughs> I've been to the Oscars as well, sneaked onto the red carpet, shook hands with people. He gets everywhere. Uh, let's take a quick look at the weather. Warm memories wherever you go. To fly, to fly, the weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Just well, easterly winds will pick up today, <laughs> gusting over the southwest, parts of Wales, and to the lee of high ground. Temperatures will be close to average for the time of year, but it will feel considerably colder. There'll be a patchy frost to start the day, but there'll be sunshine for Western Scotland as well as much of England and Wales. Early showers over Scotland should die away. Southern parts of the country will see temperatures reaching a high of 12 degrees Celsius, but values will remain in single figures for much of the country. To fly, 
The Weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Uh, before we go, um, just picked out a story that I thought was quite interesting that we might just be able to squeeze in a little bit of time for, and this is the number of teenagers mm. who are already worried about getting old and getting wrinkles. I mean, it's extraordinary, isn't it? More and more having treatments or wanting treatments mm. um, to try to, to do away with the effects of ageing. I mean, this is teenagers here. It's extraordinary. Well, I've got two girls at secondary school. I know you're a mum as well. You've got yeah. the, how many daughters? One I've daughter? got one daughter yeah. who's 25, yeah. I, I don't know if it was different when your daughter was a teenager, but my daughters know all the brands. They're, I'm not going to name them, but they're obsessed with certain brands. And they are expensive and they, they don't need this stuff. No. on growing, developing skin. If anything, they just need to be kept, kept clean. I mean, they just shy away from having a wash. Uh, I'm embarrassing them now as their dad. But, <laughs> but it's, it, it's not great. It's not great at all. Know, my other yeah. half is a very keen moisturiser. So my three-year-old gets moisturised about twice a day and has done since she was about two days old. Oh. So. Does it make it hard to catch hold of her? Yeah, 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 yeah. She yeah. slips out. Piglets, no. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> piglets. Fantastic stuff. Uh, well, we are out of time for today, but don't go anywhere. We've got all the top stories coming up for you in just a moment with Wilf.